Blog Talk Radio. Evolving Engineer Program. The acronym for the program is CREE, C-R-E-E, and that is my handle as well. And the date is August 24th, 2011. This evening, it is my great pleasure, and I will say actually this time my great honor, to have as a guest the acclaimed novelist, essayist, and activist extraordinaire, Miss Cola Booth. And I'm going to ask her what she would prefer that I call her. It's Most of my listeners know that it's my habit to uh, append a title and to refer to guests and callers by their uh, surname. Uh, but I don't know if that's something she's comfortable with, having heard several of her interviews, so she can tell, tell me. And, and in that way, I can welcome her to the program. Ms. Booth, are you with us? Yes, and you should call me Cola. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I know that my voice is probably throwing you off because I'm not sounding as African as people always expect for some reason. They seem to forget I've lived here over 30 years. And so I always have to remind people of that, that I sound very American um, on purpose, you know, because um, if I didn't, then uh, black Americans would be throwing rocks at me saying, you know, don't talk about us. <laughs> Oh, wow. I have to remind well, okay. them that I'm raised by them, you know. I think that's a good way to okay. start. Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yes, I think that's I can. A, okay. I think that's a really excellent way to start because I was going to ask you if for those who are not as familiar with your background and your work, if you would kind of give us a brief sketch and tell us anything that you think they should know about you to orient them to you know, your point of view? Um, I was born in March 1969 in Omdurman, Sudan. Uh, my father was Harith bin Farouk, who was an Arab Egyptian, a white Arab Egyptian uh, archaeologist who purchased my mother when she was 14. She was Oromo. And you know, he took her and settled in Sudan because his Egyptian family, the Kobokaks, disowned him for bringing black blood back into the Arab bloodline. They wanted to stay white Arab, and they, as my grandmother says, 
they um, spent 120 years breathing the black out. So they were very upset when he married my mother, Jitty. He wanted to have black sons, is what he told me, but he ended up with just one daughter, me. Uh, he had two sons by a mistress, I later learned after he and my mother were killed. But I was the only one who lived with him. And um, my parents, my Arab-Egyptian father and black African mother were murdered in front of me when I was six years old. UNICEF, after my Egyptian grandmother, put me up for adoption because she felt that, you know, I was too black to be in the Kovalkek family. You know, they, after my parents were murdered, they sent me to her in Egypt. And she was like, she, she can't be passed off as the maid's daughter because she looks just like a Kovalkek. So that is how UNICEF took over my life, and I ended up adopted by a black American family. I'm leaving some things out. Of, of course, in London, there were some families I was placed with, notably an Ethiopian family, but it didn't work. And so I ended up with Marvin and Claudine Johnson, who are like the heroes, really the saviors of my life. Um, two wonderful black American people who raised eight children. Four of us are adopted. And um, I was the only African, the only immigrant adoptee, however. And so I was raised in Washington, D.C. for most of my life. In 1993, I became an American citizen. Um, in 1994, I went to Israel and became a model and worked as a model and then an actress throughout the Arab world. I went back to my father's country, Egypt, and to Libya and Morocco and worked. Unfortunately, um, in 1996, and this is, I guess, what I'm probably most stigmatized by, um, is that I became the mistress of Osama bin Laden in 1996, which was not, you know, something I wanted to do. It's just that he saw me and picked me and... You know, in the Arab world, you don't. There's no such thing as dating. You don't have a choice if someone extremely powerful wants to take over your life. And I felt I had the choice that I could either die or live. And so I chose to live by pretending to really like him and to do what he wanted me to do for the six months that I was with him. And um, as you mentioned, I am a novelist and poet. Um, I've had a tenth book has now been released this summer in America, and it is called The Sexy Part of the Bible, and um, that's one of the main reasons I'm here tonight to talk. <laughs> right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, I think we should probably get to that, and I think we could probably, in a way, weave in a lot of the things that uh, people want to hear your uh, yeah. opinion. And, and just know, Cree, that I'm willing to talk about anything. I mean, there's no limit to what I would talk about. I just meant that what I'm trying to do is get people to accept my past as my past. And I know that it is very interesting past, but I just want people to understand that what I am as a writer, I'm a mother. Um, I have two children. Um, I was married for 10 years to a wonderful black man. I live in America. Um, all those things that happened in the past are interesting, and I don't mind discussing them, but I... You know, my goal is always to get people to to accept the fact that I'm not just a writer, actually, but very, very acclaimed writer. I mean, my books are really, really well reviewed and worth reading. And um, <laughs> I know that's arrogant right. to say, but you know, I just wish that people would stop worrying about who raped me once upon a time and also talk about the work that I do. You know. Like you know what's we're going to get to everything. Go ahead. You know, you know what's interesting is, uh, and, and this is going to be an opportunity for me to practice my new self improvement plan, which is uh, to really make sure that people finish what they have to say before I before I start talking. Um, yeah. And I, I think I'm a really good listener. I'm an active listener, but uh, part of my self improvement plan is to see if I can minimize the amount of times that my voice bumps into another person's voice. Um, it, it's it's you know it was I was not planning at all. I I am sure there are many listeners who know about the things that you don't want to talk about, and really and sincerely I didn't want to talk about them either. I wasn't going right. to bring them up. I just did that. It's just uh, not. I I'm sure it was terrifying and horrifying, and it's still you know 
to whatever degree it's a part of your consciousness and stuff, but it's just uh it's just not interesting enough for me to start plumbing the depths of or even refer to. But you had no way of knowing that, you know. <laughs> so that yeah. even if I had said, well, I don't want to talk about this, that was still bringing it up. So I, I you know, I, I wasn't planning on bringing it up at all. Um, you are an acclaimed writer, and but you're also just to kind of weave how weave for people how you ended up on this program is that uh, I, I was aware of your work and uh, it's it's great work. I tend to be someone who likes to read a lot of nonfiction, so I've read more of your nonfiction. And uh, but when I first contacted you. You may recall, I just didn't think that you probably had time, uh, knowing that you were on this book tour. And uh, I, I was really just don't have time. <laughs> exactly, you know. No, I know this is why I'm so thrilled that you're here. You don't have time, and she's just on a brief hiatus for the promotional tour that she's doing for the sexy part of the Bible. So for, last I heard, it was 50 cities. It may have gotten bigger than that um, by now. No, it's 50. That's all I can take. I've done about 20, so I have like 30 going. And, you know. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know. And, and your mother, too. So, I mean, there are a lot of questions right. that I have. And both of, your, and both of your children are male, which is um, going right. to be very interesting for what the, the main thing that I'm interested in. I'm, hearing, I'm interested in hearing a lot of stuff. I've already heard some stuff in terms of how you've uh, described yourself. But. But when I first contacted you, it was just, could you help me out here? I'm looking for someone that I can bring on to tell me about the issues in the, Repu- the new uh, Republic of South Sudan, who's neither Christian nor Muslim. I just didn't want that getting in the way and informing uh, the information. And uh, could, you, could, you, could you point me to someone? And you responded with, you know, I don't know anybody who can do that who's neither Christian nor Muslim. And that actually surprised me a great deal that it, I had actually thought that there were in South Sudan quite a few people who uh, practiced a, a religious traditions or original traditions. Is that not true? Okay. What are you saying? You mean are there people who are animist or Christian I, or... Is, is that... Is that the, you don't that, want Christians or Muslims? Not to talk about that, no. I didn't, no. Right. Um, I don't blame you. I mean, I worked so hard in that war. Um, I was part of the STLA, and I did so much work for the South Rebel Army. I went to Israel um, and was able to get uh, weapons and food and medication for uh, Commander Yaka and Apor, two of the main top commanders in the South Rebel Army. And... um, It's utterly hell over there. I mean, I, I'm i glad that we finally succeeded and that South Sudan is now its own country. I am, of course, I, of course, am from the north. I'm from northern Sudan. I'm half Arab. I was part of the black people who kill the authentic black people. And, and where I'm from, the chocolate people basically are mixed, and the charcoal people are the original Cushitic tribes who we want to get rid of because we all want to be Arabs, we want to be white Arabs, and we want to have the oil, uh, the money from that oil go to the Arab world. It's really backed up. It's niggerism to the 100th degree. Um, I'm really, yeah, I'm really like capsulizing everything. It goes much deeper. There's a lot of tribal things I could tell you. But one thing is, you know, because my mother was charcoal black, my father was white Arab, we were very, I was taught as a small child by the school, the local mosque, that black men have tails, that, you know, black people are inferior, that that, uh, Allah loves us less. All these things I was raised with, and so, um, you know, now that I'm an adult, I am no longer Muslim, and I'm also no longer Christian. I rejected when I grew up, and I started my own religion called the womb, which is what I consider a safe place for women to be, you know. So I'm not Christian or Muslim, not now, but I was born a Sunni Muslim in Sudan, 
And, you know, I can tell you pretty much whatever you want to know about Sudan. It just, you know, my hope is that the South will be able to maintain and have a country. That is my great hope. But will it happen? I'm very, very, I don't know. I just have very bad feelings that um, there's going to be a lot more bloodshed. I mean, I do believe they will make it as a nation. But I know the Northerners. I know my people on the North Side, and I know how evil they are. And I know that um, this is not over, unfortunately. But I will be fighting for the South no matter what happens. Okay. Um, I wanted to just kind of get that information from you at the most fundamental level. I just wanted to take some ABCs here, some basics. Uh, oh, and yeah. I think that would it, it would begin with, this is, can, can be very confusing, I'm sure you know, for people like me who are often called African Americans because... When I started to actually look at footage of the people in North Sudan, I wasn't seeing what I thought I would be seeing when I started looking at the YouTubes. And when I'm looking at these people, I'm, what am I, I'm like, what am I missing? I had always thought that these were white Arabs or at least light-skinned Arabs. But these people, if they walked down my street, nobody would think they're anything other than just one of us. And... Right. Uh, that was very confusing to me, very confusing. And so I guess I, I, I guess my first question is the very, very pale-skinned people over there who call themselves Arabs, do they classify themselves as white people? Um, yes. And, well, many of them do. Many of them don't have to, so they don't pick anything. But if they were to go to Europe or someplace, then they would suddenly pick being white. But the way it works is that Sudan is run by white, actually white-skinned Arabs who don't live in the country. The majority of them live in Saudi Arabia, Syria, Jordan, Egypt. Uh, Sudan used to be part of Egypt. And so these people have inoculated us and, cult, you know, indoctrinated us into the Arabic language, the invaders, and... The charcoal people who are lighter, I mean the chocolate people, the chocolate-skinned people who look more, like you said, like black American, are lighter, are people who have been raped uh, or enslaved historically by Arabs. And so they feel that they are Arab because that's how their master has raised them. And so, um, you know, it just, I know it is confusing for you, but... Another thing is that black Americans are far more mixed. So black Americans have kind of forgotten what black people really look like, is what I think. You know, and you have that a lot with black American people. They, you know, forget what we really, what their own ancestors in America look like. They forget that the women who came here on slave ships look like Cicely Tyson and Esther Rowe. The vast, vast, overwhelming majority were pure black people. And those women were raped back in those days, and um, usually raped as children. We need to mention that because we have a lot of ignorant black American men who constantly try to blame black women for being raped or try to pretend there was some love affair during slavery that black women were having with white men when the reality is black women did not even own themselves. They didn't own their bodies, and the majority were raped their first rapes are usually experienced at like age 9 and 10. But if you remember what those black American people actually looked like, even when slavery ended after 1865, the majority of black Americans were blue-black. The majority of black Americans were blue-black. And black Americans don't even seem to have that knowledge of their own self-history, that when slavery ended, most of them uh, were blue-black and that there was a whole movement to lighten themselves by them, not white people, but by them, to you know, everybody marry someone lighter. There's a great book that documents this, and it's called The Black or the Berry by Wallace. So, you know, it's very similar. All of that is very similar to what's going on in Sudan, the whole color and race. All of it is white supremacy. And we have a lot of black American people who, you know, a lot of black Americans, when you talk to them about slavery or things like that, they only think of those things in the terms of them, of black America. 
they don't think globally of slavery, of white supremacy, of how it is everywhere, and how everyone has been indoctrinated who is black, that on some level this has happened everywhere and it's not just them. And so often, uh, like you said, they get confused when they see what's going on in Sudan. They don't understand that those blacks who are calling themselves Arabs were owned for a thousand years by Arab people. You know what I'm saying? And have actually mm-hmm. have indeed been mixed. But when you get a mixed child in, in Africa, it's just like the whites in America who say, well, Cleopatra was mixed race, so she couldn't have been black. Well, that's completely false because the average mixed race person in Africa is black. They are visibly black with nappy hair because our blood is stronger over there than here. So when you mix with someone over there, the children don't necessarily come out white-skinned. They often come out black. And so there is a good chance that Cleopatra could be half white Greek, like they want to claim, and still have been a dark-skinned black woman. That's very possible. And so, you know, we have to start thinking of it that way. Um, You know, the the mixed people in Africa are not going to look like the mixed people in America. I've been wanting to ask you this question for some time, because I was obviously surprised the first time I learned that your father was white. That just would never occur to me by oh, looking right. at a picture of you. Um, and so then once I learned it, I was like, I wonder, what did her mother look like? And more specifically, would you say that your skin tone is halfway or near halfway between what your mother's was and what your father's was? Okay, my mother was charcoal black. She was charcoal. I mean, literally, the blackest black. Charcoal is blacker than blue black. Now, a lot of black Americans are familiar with blue black because you started out a good majority of you as blue blacks. But charcoal is even blacker than that. Charcoal is like silvery felt black. It's like... You know, I don't think you have charcoal people in America. I have never seen... I've seen blue blacks here in the south part of America, like Mississippi, Alabama. um, I've seen the blue blacks here, but I've never seen a charcoal black in America, unless it was an African. So my mother was the very blackest black woman, She was, which is why he wanted her, because he wanted to have black sons. Um, My father was... Arabian looking, you know, what we call white Arab is not actually, it's not uh, Caucasoid, which is what we call white European. What you call white is like the the uh, Caucasian, well, how would I say it a better way, Caucasian uh-huh. is the word you use. But we call them Caucasoids in North Africa, meaning, because we don't call white people white. We call them the Caucasoids, and then the white Arabs are the white people. Oh. So... The Caucasian is a better word, and that is what the Europeans are. That's the whitest white. But, no, my father was an Arab white person, meaning um, Omar Sharif. You know, he was my father was that kind of look. He looked very Middle Eastern. He uh-huh. was lighter than Gaddafi. So that's a good way to explain how he looked. He was lighter skinned than Gaddafi. Oh, Okay. Um, I think the class... Yeah. And you know what's funny is that my father became a heroin addict. A great deal of why was because he wanted to be accepted as black. And he worked his whole life with the Dinka and Noor and Shilluk tribes in southern Sudan. Um, he did everything for black Africans. He wanted so much to be accepted by them. And they did accept him as a good friend, as a son in a way, but... They would never accept him as black, of course, because in Africa we don't have one-drop rule and, you know, we don't believe in that kind of thing. So they would never accept him as being black. And um, he always told me when I was little that that was why he did the drugs he did, because he just had nowhere to belong. You know, he felt he didn't, he really hated the Arabs, of which he was part of them, because they were so racist. Uh, this opens up so. Me? This opens up so many questions. Um, I guess. Yeah. So many questions. Of, of course, the ringing question. The ringing question is: What was with your father? How 
in a global system of white supremacy, which I probably should stop and ask you that first. I know that you have used that term, white supremacy. I've seen you use it. I remember you writing that your father told you that white supremacy was the world's only true religion. So I've seen you use that term, and that's not a, a, a concept that I have a problem with at all. Um, but because of the way that you've just articulated, black people, especially in this part of the world, get confused and do not realize the scope of it, namely the global scope of it, you know, defining what that is, at least as we're talking, even if we don't agree on the definition, me knowing and the listeners knowing what you mean when you say white supremacy and, and what I mean when I say white supremacy, I think will be important. So, I mean, certainly most of the listeners of this program know that it's global. It's, you know, it's not just in this part of the world. Oh, right, so just, right. Yeah, white yeah. supremacy, so you want me to explain what that is to me? Um, uh, yes. White supremacy is just the belief that all things white are better. Um, white people's hair, white light-skinned eyes, lighter skin. Um, you don't have to have white people present to have white supremacy. It just means that the lightest goes on top. The belief that the lightest automatically goes on top, which has become ingrained in slave people and colonialized people, that is white supremacy, and that's what my father considered white supremacy to be. And, um, you know, like you said, he was from a family of white supremacists. My whole Egyptian family are white supremacist people. They sent him to school in the south of France, and while there he met black American, because he was actually engaged to a black American woman that my Egyptian family rejected, and he let it go. He let her go. Um, my mother came after that. And so when he was in the south of France, he met a lot of jazz musicians from America who were black. And he started to form a different opinion because they were very uh, political. And they were telling about racism. And he recognized the stories they were telling as being from Africa as well. You know, like the police beating up black men. And, you know, these are the stories these musicians from America would tell in France. And my father recognized all of this going on in, you know, Egypt, where he was from. So he wanted to, you know how young kids are, he wanted to, um, he knew he had black blood. And so he wanted to rebel against his family and bring the black back in uh, to the family. And so his whole thing was the same as mine, was that white supremacy is the the worship and the the um, the normalization, making anything whiter, the whiter it is, the more normal it is. The lighter the skin, the more normal it is, um, better. Um, that whole and and most of the people in the Arab, in the black world now, I would say seventy to eighty percent of black people globally are white supremacists. You know, they don't think of themselves that way or know it. You know, it's not something they purposely, but. If you put a test in front of most black people, at the end of the test you will find the majority are white supremacists. They think that the lighter hair is better, the lighter skin, the lighter, you know, in every circumstance almost, they will gravitate to lightness. And so that is what white supremacy is. It's not the KKK and homes being burned and hanged and, you know, all that kind of, that's the dramatic end of it. But what we're talking about is a scientific, clinical, day-to-day -day living, uh, the aesthetic, the aesthetic belief in likeness is better. And, and most people have indoctrinated that and now believe that way, even when they don't even think about what they believe, they do. Okay. I concur with everything that you just said, and I'm wondering if, if I were to state my definition of it, pretty succinctly, I'm wondering if you think in any way what I'm about to say uh, contradicts or is in conflict with with the way that you've explained your understanding of, of white supremacy. So for me, I say that racism and white supremacy are the same thing only because uh, I don't see any other functional form of racism. that People can dream about it and fantasize about it in terms of the day-to-day, -day, as you said, doing it. I don't see anybody else doing it except for, you know, the people who have who wield this thing called white supremacy. And, you know, it is, I think, 
more than just a way of thinking or a prejudice. I, th I think it is the dominant social material system of the known universe. And the reason I say known universe instead of just the planet is because if if we were to get on a space capsule and go out to Mars or the, or the moon, we'd be taking that with us. Um, they don't. The people who practice this thing, I don't think they're going to stop it just just because we leave uh, gravity on this earth. So I, I would say it's you know it's the dominant social material system of the known universe, and that it's practiced. It's a, it's a way of thinking, speaking, and behaving in every possible facet of human activity or people activity. And it's I guess where I, I would really want to hear what you say about it is uh, is is whether or not this is something that. Um, it, does it go away? Does it? If we were to get rid of all the the Caucasoids, as you say, on the planet, does white supremacy go away? Well, no, it's not really them anymore. You know, they already did their part hundreds of years ago to set it in. They planted the seed hundreds of years ago, and now it's bloomed. I agree with your uh, definition of it because to me, to me, you just said in a whole different way the same exact thing I said. Okay. Um, I do believe that it is, uh, like I said, it's ingrained to such a way that you, if you tested people with a paper test asking them this, that, and the other, they would come up with the end white supremacist. The majority of us would. Um, I think it definitely can go away. It just takes the same thing that it took for slavery to go away, which is for us to become aware that it's not right. And that is what is starting to happen with just the discussion we are having. Just think, in 1974, people were not actually discussing colorism, uh, the treatment of other blacks by blacks. It was very rarely discussed. There were some books and some discussion of it, but it was not, you know, the main thing was what black people were saying was that, you know, the white people are the bad people and we've been oppressed and that kind of a thing. Well, now it's becoming much more multi-layered and splintered because now that we have freedom, we get to see other ways that we are oppressed, not just by white people, but by all people who are somewhere on that strata line of color. Um, everyone is practicing this. And, you know, let's definitely mention that the darkest-skinned people are often the ones that practice colorism against blacks the most, believe it or not, you know. How's that work? Experience. Well, I'm saying the majority of the dark-skinned black men, when I look at their music videos and the images that they will allow is beautiful, um, that's one way in which it shows itself. You know, and I've also noticed dark, dark, dark black-skinned women to be more likely to want children with good hair. And, to, and to, I'm saying verbalize these things. Then I will see a light-skinned so-called black woman. Uh, those women are usually trying to hold on to blackness more. They are not as concerned about what complexion the children will be and all of this thing. And so a lot of times the people who are practicing, even if it's because they've been victimized, it's still they are practicing this demon way of life, and they often are the main you know, the darkest people, unfortunately. And so um, it definitely can be worked on. I don't know how many hundreds of years it's going to take to counteract it, but we are now, just by so adamantly and, and, and vividly discussing it and putting it out there and questioning people, you know, by actually questioning who was the, uh, you just saw him, the, re the recent baseball player who was in the news because he lightened himself. Oh, uh, oh gosh! What was his name? Oh my gosh! Yeah. It'll come to me. He's from the but Dominican the thing Republic. Is you know, right, it'll come to you. But you know what I'm saying is that. Right. See, now we are actually literally talking about this on Twitter and Facebook, where we used to never have conversations about this issue. Literally, Cree, people have to be made aware it's happening. It's like people have been living off colorism for hundreds of years and not even aware of it. The people didn't notice they were so color struck. You know what I mean? People really yeah. were not conscious of why they wanted to date so and so or why they didn't like so and so's children. Now, because we are discussing this issue, we are getting people to notice it in themselves and they are shocked. They always thought that they would just love blackness. And now a lot of black people are finding out no, you do not love blackness. 
Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's funny. But that's how it changes, is by us stopping to notice it and to start rebelling, rebelling, especially the dark-skinned black woman who was on the bottom of the food chain, who is the one that it affects the most nefariously. She is the top victim of it. And she is the main one who has to wake up and start having her children raised different, even if her children are by white men. She has to start teaching them um, a whole new way to fight against this. And that is what I think I am doing, and I think a lot of black women, I listen to the music of India Ari, Lauren Hill, and I hear them clearly objecting to it. Jill Scott, and you know, lyrics that you didn't used to hear in music. All of a sudden, there are clear things these women are making in their music about, which shows that it's, if if they are doing it, that means that socially, nationwide, although we can't see it on TV, there are probably many, many people, especially black, and black women, who are starting to rise up against this belief. And so it may be 100 years from now when we finally see the seeds that those women planted um, coming to fruition. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, I don't even know. <laughs> You know what I mean? How mixed, how far will have it gone by the time we wake up is the question. Uh, okay, yeah. You know, because yeah. just like you had Africans who thought slavery was good and that it was okay to sell your own people. You had African people in Africa who thought that way. And look how long and how much happened before they finally woke up. You know, it's like, well, damn, so much destruction was done. So that's my only thing is I worry, you know, when we wake up, God, how much will we have gone through? You know what I mean? And maybe even how much of us will even be left? Right. You know. <laughs> there is I know in Africa, I'm so grateful in Africa that we don't have a one-drop rule because it's harder there to completely wipe them out. It's much easier to erase black Americans because most black Americans are willing to be erased. They want to be as light and have as good hair as possible in their mind. So they really don't have a system in place to question it. Whereas an African person who mates interracially is expected to also produce black children. The tribe will come down on them. Oh, is that right? Well, oh, yeah. I mean... They, you will find so many of these rich African men who are flaunting a white wife and kids, and what you don't realize, they have a African wife and kids back home in their country, and no one talks about it. And we need to start outing this to show people, you know, this whole, it's just so sick what's going on. It's very sick. But, yeah, the tribes don't want these mixed kids. They really don't, and so um, and they never really will embrace them. These kids go around the world, like the group Les Nubians. Those two women are biracial, and they are not really embraced by Nubian people. But, you know, they have marketed themselves as Les Nubians, the Nubians. And, um, you know, not in Africa, though. The people who are in the Nubian are not. Nubian people don't look at those girls as Nubians. But, you see, that's what I'm saying is that, the pressure is on those people to make some real Nubians. And so that's the good thing about Africa that I like, whether people think it's whatever. I like the fact that uh, with Africa, there is still the pressure to be authentic because you won't find that in America very much with blacks. Blacks in America don't even remember what blackness is a lot of the time. Like I was saying earlier, they, you know they don't really ever worry about authenticity and all that with blackness, ever. I've never known them to. And it's mainly because they believe anybody can be black. Now, this is novel. This will be novel to a lot of my listeners, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> um, within a a population of people who have studied what is called scientific counter-racism, uh, who own and have read all the way through, at least once, uh, Neely Fuller's work, The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. 
there is the principle that because white supremacy is supreme, white people, whoever that is, call the shots. And it is they who do the classifying. And so a black person wouldn't okay, have the power. Okay, you keep breaking up. I hear oh, you. Oh, it's me. I hear okay. you, but you keep... You keep breaking up. It's like it's stuttering your sentences. Because I don't okay, know if, what uh, something is called. Go ahead. It, okay, it might be the computer. So I think for a little while until this computer uh, straightens itself out, uh, I may have to take a little bit of a break, uh, like, you know, 30 seconds. I may need to, to, to call you on a, another line because um, I, oh. I, don't, I don't want the quality of the, the dialogue to get compromised. Uh, let me just take a little bit of a break, 30 seconds, if the listeners will hold on, and uh, I'll be right back. Okay. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? At counterracism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com.
Okay. Uh, assuming that I can be heard, and I'm fairly certain that I can. I shouldn't say fairly. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat certain. I just uh, finished talking with uh, Cola Booth, uh, dialed her back, and uh, let her know how absolutely um, disappointed that I am that this is happening. And uh, she agreed to be patient and said that if I could get this uh, working in the next 10 or 15 minutes, she would definitely come back on. She said she's not surprised that this is happening because it seems that every time she comes on one of these types of uh, programs, this is what happens, and she thinks that they've actually rigged this to happen. Um, and so I'm not, you know, uh, I'm, I'm disappointed that it's happening. I'm frustrated, but, you know, uh, it's not to be, it's not unexpected. So what I want to do is I just wanted to let the listeners know that that, that this was happening, and to please be patient. This happened with Dr. Welsing as well uh, a while back, and people were very patient. So I, I think I can presume that uh, that the knowledge of the system is intact enough with, with the listeners that they will uh, be patient. Okay, so if you'll hold on, I'll put on another music file, and hopefully within about five to ten minutes we should be back on, on track, and I'll have Ms. Uh, Ms. Booth back on track. Thank you for your patience. Okay, now what do I do? That's the number. What do I do? Now just tell me, please. Delete those numbers. Okay. Okay. Hang up. No, I can't hang up. That wouldn't be nice. Well, that's not the number that you... No, I know. But I can't... This is the... I know, but now what do I do? I can't hang up. So now I want to get a three-way call. What do I do? Seven. Dial another number? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. I can't even hear her. Okay, dial, in, dial this number now.
we're good. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, I think we're back on. Okay, hopefully we won't lose too much time and we can just pick right up where we were. I apologize to the listeners. I'm glad that you hung with us, uh, explained what was happening, and uh, now I'll just try to regain my composure and try to pick up where we were. Okay, so I think where we were was taught, I think we were talking about the fact that the, the fact that it's being talked about and it's being sung about uh, by popular singers probably indicates that there is more awareness of this in the general populace than is apparent, and we'll see it in the next generation. Is that what where you were with it? Okay, say it again. It's just that it's topping you up, but I can hear you. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is really true, because this is an entirely different phone. Um, okay. Uh, I know. I'm so sorry, Cree. I don't know why this is happening. I, you know... Uh, I can hear some... you, but it's like it chops up, so it's like it talks slower. Maybe that will help me to hear what you're asking me. Okay, I will talk slower, and hopefully it's discernible to the listening let's just, audience. Let's just do the show. We have to just, let's just go on with the show. But I'm okay. just saying let's just, just talk a little slower, because I heard you, but I it keeps chopping you up every, like, ten words. Okay, so, okay. Uh, okay, I need to speak slower anyway. So, as I recall... Where we were in the conversation was that you had said that you believed that the fact that the issue of colorism was being sung about by popular singers is an indication that the awareness of it in the general population is much greater and that we would see the fruits of that maybe in the next generation. Is, do I, am I encapsulating what you said? Right. Yes, that exactly. Okay. Um, now, I guess I'm. I don't know if he, I don't know if you are, but that's difficult for. It's hard for me to hear people in their twenties, thirties, right, uh, acting as if, and they do. This is the first time they've heard this. It's like a re- eureka moment, and I don't understand that. Uh, I just, I, 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 I grew up hearing this, and and if I grew up hearing this, you know, four plus decades ago, how in the world right. could we be that? I don't, I, I really don't understand. It. And and I'll, this is as a as a novelist, as somebody who really peers into the soul of people, I think you could answer this question. Right. I guess I, what I don't understand is that even if there, you had were never aware of any kind of political movement about this, just uh, an instinct to embrace yourself and to try to love yourself, it seems I don't see why that alone wouldn't just immediately spring up in you when you hear things that make it seem as if you're less than because you you look the way that you look. I, I don't understand why you have to be well, taught see, to do that. it's not done that way, Cree. It's not done that way. Colorism is not carried out that way. It doesn't matter what you think of yourself if you're not being picked to dance with. You can think the world of yourself, but if you go to the club every Saturday and no one wants to dance with you because... That person is not to be mated with or procreated with. Or if you're an actress and you go to try out for parts and you're not taken seriously because women who look like you cannot be beautiful, no matter how beautiful you are, um, you know, all the way around in the community, it doesn't really matter what you think of yourself if there is an institutionalized disallowing, as Toni Morrison uses the term, disallowing. If that is going on, then it really doesn't matter how much you think that you are beautiful or, you know, this and that and the other. Of course, people are denying that this is going on because they benefit. People who benefit the most, light-skinned women, uh, white people, 
you know, everyone who it doesn't really affect are going to be the ones who, oh, I don't know, I've never noticed that, or it's not so bad, or, you know, they'll be the ones that are doing that. But that is normal. That is just, I mean, remember, Jim Crow had to be taken on and dismantled, and there were most black people in the Jim Crow era predicted that Jim Crow would always be with us, that it would never be over. Most black people, when the southern blacks said that we don't want to have water fountains and all these things, for decades, black people said, oh, that's never going to end. It's always been that way. It's going to be that way. People always think that things are going to stay the way that they are until someone like Harriet Tubman comes along. And literally, it only takes one person to totally turn the world on its head. So I I know what you're saying. I I love you just for the fact that you are willing to talk about these issues so openly with me and are willing to have me on talking about it. But trust me, uh, it has just begun. The whole unraveling of it is beginning now. Just the fact that next month, a documentary called Dark Girls is coming into nationwide theaters. Um, the issue is spreading and becoming more and more talked about, and not just with African Americans or Africans. Remember, also in India, this is a huge problem, and now you have Indians talking about it. You have uh, people from the Latino world, and you even have Koreans and Chinese talking about the treatment of darker skin, almost black, Mongolians and Koreans. It is really starting to become a global topic, and um, that is usually when you see things start to be uh, changing is when you start to hear what's going on now where people, as much as they don't want to talk about it, you have a lot of people like me who are forcing the issue, who are not allowing it to not be talked about, and it's going to get rougher. It's going to get much worse because, I mean, think of the children of me. Think of the children of women like me, um, this issue, or women like, you know, the children of Marita Golden. This issue is just not going to go away. I, I guess where I would want to go next is, uh, well, let's, let's let's go here. The last program that I had, we were talking about colorism. And uh, there were, to their credit, two black males who phoned the show. And I'm sure you've heard this part before, but be be, be patient. Uh, There were three females, one of whom I'm not sure how she would classify herself as, except that I know that she wouldn't classify herself as white. And she had uh, proposed uh, what we call code, in other words, a code of behavior. And she had said that she believed, and it was very formal, but that she was proposing that people did not date or marry or have sex with um, anyone who was paler skinned than themselves because when they do that, under this system, it's affirming that light is better and that ultimately white is better. And in the process of, in the course of that conversation, one of the two black males said that he did not think that that was a good suggestion because it would introduce even more conflict and division between, amongst black people. Is that a valid concern? Okay, they were saying, I'm just going to reiterate some of it, is that the woman was saying that we shouldn't mate with someone who's lighter than us. Yes, I and she was, and she was light-skinned. She was, okay, she was light-skinned, just to let you know. Right. She was very light-skinned. Right, okay, I got it now. I don't know. I don't think that we can go that far. I think what we have to do is just educate ourselves about, and especially the black people, the blackest black people, um, they the most need to be reconditioned. For instance, when I was just saying, doesn't matter what you think of yourself at the club if no one's choosing you, it is not usually light-skinned people who are not choosing dark-skinned women at the club. It's usually dark-skinned men. So that's what I'm saying. If we will stop producing, my sons are both by a black father. I am dark-skinned. Their father's dark-skinned. My sons are dark-skinned. But my sons have been raised to cherish and to see dark skin on women as beautiful. 
So my sons are not likely to go to the club and say, oh, I'm not going to dance with a certain girl because she's not dark skinned. So that is really where the problem comes in for the most part. I am not seeing light-skinned people, even though they benefit from colorism and, and have a vested interest in not seeing it stop, I have not really seen them campaign to, well, I mean, in some parts of Africa, sure. But for the most part, I have not seen them, uh, I don't, I don't want us to be prejudiced against light-skinned people is what I'm saying. I don't condone the idea that, okay, now we have to exclude people who are light-skinned or not love them or I can't be sisters with a girl who's light-skinned. I think that's ridiculous. I think that we share blood, we share history, we share so many things that to my mind are unbreakable. Now, I may not particularly see someone light-skinned as black. Uh, of course not, because I'm, I'm Sudanese, I'm African. I, of course, so I'm not going to see it. Everyone who's light is black. But I still recognize them as having African blood and being my direct family. I still see them as part of my African clan, even if I don't see them as black. I still see that woman as my sister, even if I don't feel she's a black woman or represents black women in a physical sense. I still see her as my blood relative sister. So I don't think we need to do that, no. What I think is that in time, if we disable colorism, it will naturally, we will begin to darken naturally, just the way we undarken. It will be the same exact process. It will be very slow, and it will be a gradual thing where we just more and more light-skinned people will find that they are now darker skin, and will not be like a violent force of thing. I don't think that's good to have the rule that she was saying. I don't even think it worked anyway. Okay. Um, now I don't want to misrepresent her suggestion. And I don't. I, I hope I'm not misrepresenting, and hopefully she'll call, and hopefully people can hear this enough to where because we, you know, um, but I, I, I think she would say. I, I don't think that she would say she doesn't feel like a sister, she, she, a sisterhood with me, um, and I think that she would say that the choices to mate, and 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 and, and as you, I think so so brilliantly articulated, to reproduce oneself. Um, are two different things, you know. Uh, right. So, and, and I guess the question becomes, um, and, and this question was asked by one of the black males, if you five years from now, eight years from now, were to see a darker-skinned male with a lighter-skinned female or non-black female, um, or if you were to see a whole bevy of them, how would you know which ones are doing it because of a true affection that was not tainted by colorism? I don't, I don't tainted meaning uh, that, that doesn't mean color; it just means you know something poisonous. This was not poisoned by color co colorism. And how would you know which ones are actually the result of that kind of of that color sickness? How would you know that? At this at this point, I don't care which ones are or are not. They all are against what. Um, none of them are representative of uh, what I'm dreaming right now. Now, believe it or not, there was a time when I dreamed of a world where interracial was acceptable and I could see a couple like that walking and everyone would be happy about it because I actually am not against interracial at all. Uh, I've been in interracial relationships. I'm not against that. What I'm against is the self-hatred, and at this point the numbers are so outrageously epidemic in America that it doesn't really matter who is really in love anymore because there are so many who are not. Yeah, I mean, for everyone that's really in love, there's like 500 who aren't. And so there's so many who are not that it no longer matters. What we matter now is that there is this huge sickness that is threatening to eradicate what I love, what is natural to me, which is my people. And you don't have a lot of black people who are not there yet. They don't feel like me. They, you know, some of them don't live in places I live. Like I live in California, which is the capital of this whole uh, 
mania that is going on. So you have someone who lives in a deep southern black city who doesn't ever see this, who thinks I'm crazy, because they don't see the erasure happening where they are. And so, you know, I'm trying to allow for that. But at the same time, um, yeah, I don't even think in terms of, well, who loves who or whatever. All I know is that I don't want to be part of a culture. I do not want to be part of an interracial city, an interracial, you know, and I've been in interracial relationships. I want to be black. I choose to be black. I wanted my children to be black. I don't want my people to be erased. I don't have some grand fantasy that if we all just have sex and become mixed, then the world will be a better place. I come from North Africa where we have disproven that. We have proven in North Africa that you're a damn lie when you think that mixing will change things. It won't. It makes it worse, much worse. Because then once you mix everybody, and like I said, where I'm from is a good example, everyone's at each other's throat because now you don't have the strength of the tribes. You don't have, you know, whole families don't even feel related to each other because they don't look alike. And it does matter that you look alike. It really does. When you look similar to your people, you have instant trust. People don't trust people who don't look like them. People don't trust people who don't have the same problems. If one of us has bone straight hair and the other one has black people's hair, we're not going to have the same experiences. And it causes a chasm, a separation. No matter how much you love each other, there will always be one of you will be treated different than the other. And when you put it on a huge scale, it becomes more separation, more scatteredness. And like I said, with black Americans, you have people here who don't really have a standard for blackness. Therefore, when you believe that anybody can be black, you are really susceptible and open to having your whole family destroyed because you have some fantasy that, you know, Chinese and all of us can just be family, and it can, and it doesn't work that way. The American Indians showed that today when the Cherokee Nation today announced that they were going to expel all black uh, descendants from the Cherokee Nation. That's in the news today. I'm not making that up. So, you know, and I'm not surprised that a lot of black Americans are hurt they're on Twitter talking about how, you know, you know, screwed up that is, how wrong it is. But, no, that's how most people who have not been slaves, who have not been colonized, that is how most people see uh, their identity. They don't see it in the ways that black Americans see identity. And they are going to do whatever they have to do to protect their identity, including exclude you. And that's what the people of my tribe, the Oromo, would do. I mean, it's the same thing. So, you know, I just am more realistic, I think, about this whole race. Uh, you know, I'm not against interracial, and I, that's a huge misconception that people have against me. I've been in quite a few interracial, interracial relationships. I'm just really not buying the whole American version of what that means. Of you know what I feel is that they have always hated Black Americans in this country. That's why they enslaved them. That's why they lynched you. And because they hate Black people, they hate the skin, the hair. They think Black people are ugly. Many Black Americans have bought into also you know that white supremacist outlook. And so now uh, they just found a new way to get rid of these people. Is that oh great they hate themselves and they all want to have white babies. Great. You know, it goes to the whole history of this country. It, it's what they've always wanted is to get rid of you. So it's just a new way to get rid of a lot of people, and it's working in some quarters. That's how I see it. I don't see this whole big love thing that, oh, we're a great nation, everyone's falling in love. and You know, it's fake. It's a big lie. It's a big lie. And most people who aren't black American can see it. Even the white people can see that it's a crappy lie, but guess what? It is helping to divide and destroy black American people. I know that black American women certainly feel betrayed and certainly feel separated from black American men, and right there, that is your destruction. You, there is no way to overcome that. You cannot replace a black American woman with a Mexican or Indian or white and continue to be black Americans. You just cannot do it. Eventually, you will be something else. 
and that's something else. You know, the, the grass always looks greener on the other side. Well, where do you get there? And see what we have in North Africa. That's the kind of bastardization we have in North Africa where all these different people are no longer what they were. They don't know what they were. They're divided. Everybody's trying to claim something else. You have total pandem pandemonium and disconnection. And that's what the reality of what you have to look forward to. It's not going to be some great uh, love blossom of all the, you know, the rainbow. There is no rainbow. That's just a big hoax that America, you know, runs around talking. Nobody else buys into that crap. Now, if someone were to say, if the system of white supremacy left the planet, then it wouldn't matter how people... I would agree. Okay. I guess where I'm confused... I would agree. I think that if white supremacy left, that more people would... You know what? If, if an e-playing field and we were not programmed that way, then we fought incidences of people willing to go out of their own group. And that is what the real love is. That's where it is. And you see people who know nobody's doing this and they ain't willing to do this. That is love. You know what I'm saying? Not when the whole city saying, oh, God, I want babies with good hair. And it's everybody doing it. There's no pressure on them. There's no, you know, God just miraculously made a group of women who are unlovable, all black women who are dark-skinned. God just miraculously said, I created this group to be alone and not loved and not chosen. It's a joke. Now, yeah, if we get rid of supremacy, if we have an even playing field to where everyone's beauty and desirability is recognized, that's a whole different story. And I would be throwing the weddings for people. I mean, I would actually be holding weddings for these interracial couples then because, you know, it would be not based on hating blackness. Now, let this plane go over. I normally wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> I've had to go to a different phone. And um, Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm somewhat con confused. I'm somewhat confused on your position. This is, please don't take this as, because, uh, let me oh, say no, this before. I'm fine. Okay, okay. Um, I'm somewhat confused on, on your, your position only in that I don't know how I would, how will I know when it's, how will I know when the color sickness is gone? What, would, what is the criteria? What would I not see? Or what would I see at, as relates to how people make their mating selections? I mean, like with my eye, what, what would I see? see? You will see what you see when it's gone is people presenting. They are, for instance, you won't see Miss Jamaica be a white woman. I'm sorry, Miss Haiti. Now, you've seen the pictures of Haiti on television, right? <laughs> yeah. So how can Miss Haiti be white? Do you see what I'm saying? Right. How could she possibly, how can the most beautiful woman in Haiti possibly be white? Well, when that whole color thing is gone, you will not see things like Miss Haiti being white. You will not see most of the NBA married to non-black. What you will see is what you see now when you see Japanese people or Chinese people or white people or, um, you know, you will see groups that are more indigenously Curried. You would you will see people mostly with their own people, without it being uh, a distraction. You know what I'm saying? That is actually what is more normal. It's not normal to have imbalances like this, where seventy percent of black women, as they love to constantly announce on television, are unmarried or you know raising children alone and. That right there is a huge uh, red light that's letting you know something's wrong. I don't know how we can ignore it. But those are the abnormal things. That's not normal. How come the African continent waited a 1,000 years to decide that their women are not fit to be women? You know. So once the world is, uh, that whole color thing is gone, I'm sure people can imagine what it will be like. It will be completely the opposite of what we have now. 
Okay. So then if that if one of the things, one of the, the primary things we will see is that we will see black males with their twins, right, with their, their, right. their opposite Well, you'll gender. see them, right, just like you see white males. And right, right. Most white men, you, exactly. That is how you will see it. As no, It'll be normal again. Right. It, okay. So that's what I would see. I guess I'm still trying to figure out then why it would be an incorrect thing to want to do that now in order to get there. You know, it's like, like you wouldn't prescribe that behavior. You might suggest that behavior for other people. But no, but I'm saying only, they but you could only pres- do that. But you can only prescribe that behavior for yourself. You see that? Does that make sense? What I'm saying is that once the whole color thing dies and black women start producing this color-struck sick sun and stop wanting babies with good hair, once that changes, it will be gradual that you will start to see more and more of what is normal, of black people loving black people. And as that goes along, many of these light-skinned people, just by being the mating the way that it will be going, they will begin to darken just the way that they lighten. I mean, a good example is the book The Blacker the Berry by Wallace Thurman, and I would hope that being black Americans, many of you have read this book. It came out in 1929. But the book showed how they bred themselves lighter and lighter and lighter. There were uh, there were actually very few mulattoes when slavery ended compared to the black people. They constantly bred, and I mean they would take a mulatto girl who was club-footed or who was uh, mentally retarded and mate with her just to get a lighter baby. This is what black people would do back then. So if you can imagine that, then imagine it reversed. Those light, light people became lighter and lighter because that was the style, so to speak. That was what was in vogue, was for them to, everyone coveted lightness. If we automatically coveted our own darkness, then and eventually it would go just the other way. Um, it's a gradual thing. The woman who was saying, well, let's just start doing this like it's a law, I don't think life can ever work that way, Cree. That's like me telling my two sons never to date a white girl or you better not marry. I would never say that, ever. Because once you say something like that, the opposite is going to happen. But isn't well, that what I white people... Isn't that what white people what tell their, their ch- isn't that what white people tell their children? Not in the way of outright like that. Not in the outright uh, racist. You know, I would never say don't die, date so and so. What I would do is, which is what I have done, is taught my children to see dark skin a different way. From birth, they were taught that your skin is the color of the earth that the trees come up out of, that everything grows from. My husband had a book in the house called The Book of Good Luck, or it's sort of like the tooth fairy when anything would happen with our sons. If their tooth came out or they had a good report card, they had to go and put that tooth or report card in a scrapbook that had nothing but beautiful pictures of chocolate, beautiful ebony women all through the book, hundreds of them. And then the next day when they wake up, money would be in that book where they had put their report card or their tooth. So they came to associate from that book growing up all their lives that beautiful black ebony chocolate women are like a treasury of riches, of, you know, everything good. Do you see what I'm saying? How genius. How genius. Right. That's well, this is how we raised our children. We never, we never ever told our children you cannot date someone who's light-skinned or who's white. or You don't do that. If you do that, it's going to just mess up everything. That is not how you do it. What you do is you just teach your children that blackness itself is beautiful. And we also taught them that other races of people were beautiful, but they are not us. They are not our, uh, you know, our fa- their father raised them, that me, him, and them are a cocoon, a family, that, you know, other races of people are to be respected and cherished because God or whatever force you believe in expects that of us as humans to be neighborly. You know, you're so always supposed to love other human beings and people. You know, my son saw me, white people broke down in their car on the road, and I brought them in and fed them while we fixed their car or let them use the phone. You're supposed to be brotherly and sisterly to all human beings. 
But at the same time, we raised our sons visually that their skin was so valuable and beautiful and that their mother was so beautiful and valuable and their father was so beautiful and valuable and that hopefully they will go on to reanimate us, to bring us back into the world, to keep the seed of our particular. And so that is a very authentically African way to look at things that we all used to have. But that is what I'm saying that we need to start practicing. You, it, to me, it's it's not smart to start saying, okay, you cannot marry those light skin or those white or those. The minute you do that, you're going to have rebellion. Pretty. That's not the way to do it. But we can start to, you know, in these music videos, put beautiful chocolate images of our people can easily be taught back the other way if we can wake up enough people to realize. I mean, every 10 years they do a doll test, and black children always fail the doll test. They always pick the white dolls. And so black people, you would think, would start to wonder where that's coming from. Well, these music videos, these magazines, we are the ones teaching our children that white is better, that light is better. And so, you know, we can consciously start to stop doing that. That's the only way it's going to happen. You can't, you know, verbally tell someone, don't marry white, don't marry this, don't marry that, you know. They have to feel loved. People go where they feel loved. And if we can make black children love blackness, more black children will feel loved by people who look like them. You know? Well, now how did, how, I want to hear what, what other suggestions you would have for what to do. Um, but I guess I have the question of how does that, how did you manage to keep that from getting drowned out by all the other messages that they get? you know, at school, in magazines, on television, in movies? Our kids were not allowed to watch. Yeah, our children were not allowed to watch television. Their father tapes programs uh, that they are allowed to see on tape. And so they had several hours a night where they can watch, for instance, uh, The Prince of Egypt was okay for them to watch. Founder was, you know, the movie about the dog was okay for them to watch. Certain movies and images were allowed to wear. Uh, they were very sheltered, really, and remained that way because they're still not teenagers yet. They were very sheltered from the images. They don't watch the ET. They don't see music videos, all that kind of a thing. The school they go to, they're the only black kids. All the other kids are biracial. All, the All other, of them? You know, so well, there's white kids, there's biracial kids, and then there's two black boys who are my sons. Let me tell you, in the valley where we live, me and their father was the only black man, black woman couple. All the rest of them were 19 black men with white women. That is what is in this. And so our children were never friends. Uh, with these, you know, we teach our children. Uh, for instance, they had a white, uh, well, a mixed friend, this white, this uh, half-white boy who keeps his head shaved because he doesn't want his father's hair to show. So he keeps his head shaved so that, because he looks more white without that, you know, if his head is not, uh, doesn't show the black hair, then he looks like a white child. And so we taught our children all about that, that this is what the result of that marriage is, um, look at this boy who hates his own father, who said out of his mouth, Daddy, why do you have fucked up hair like that? This is a boy to his black father. So we show our, we use that to show our children. Look at these people and what they have become because of this person's self-hatred. We do teach our children about self-hatred, and we call it that. We teach them about how black people always pick and, you know, now to them it's ridiculous because they've been raised that the, the best thing you can be is black. So they really, really see it as a sickness when, you know, we point these things out. But I was lucky because I had a husband who thinks how I think. He's not American. He is from Belize. He's a Garifuna. And so um, he thinks the way that I think as far as we did not want our children to be self-hating. We were very, very uh, 
from the day they were born. For instance, I could not have a hair weave or a wig, and I wear hair weaves and wigs, but I could not have it because he didn't want my son, you know, when the baby reaches for your hair, that's one of the first things that uh, they come in contact with in, in life as a baby. And if they're reaching and you have Caucasian hair in your head, you are already brainwashing your children from birth. And so a lot of black people don't think about that. So, you know, my husband was like, you're, they need to touch your nappy hair. They need to touch your African hair. And that is how uh, we did things. Um, as they got older, I have, you know, they've seen me with um, hair weaves and wigs and things, but now they understand it more as a prop and not as something, you know, they look down on it as not being as good as mommy's natural hair. <laughs> yeah. In that novel. It's sort of like a true. white child. You know, think of a white child and their mother wore an afro. Well, they might think it's cute for the day, but those white children know that that is not, that that afro she's wearing is inferior to her long, bouncy. You see what I'm saying? So my yeah. kids see it the same way, but in reverse. Um, and it's because we conditioned them. We deliberately conditioned our children to see things that way. And like I said, again, I'm so against racism. I am not, against, I am not for this whole idea of let's exclude people and say that someone is not good enough or... That's the fine line I draw. I know it sounds confusing, like, well, Cola, which is it? But really, crew, what I, I, I can't get with that woman who's saying that, you know, tell your ch- your sons not to marry light-skinned women. And, you know, if we just raise our children to love blackness, including our light-skinned children, it will automatically turn out. Because, see, those light-skinned children will all be more like Barack Obama. They will love chocolate. And they will marry someone chocolate, and they will both, as chocolate parents, even though one's light-skinned, they will both raise their children to love chocolate. That's what I'm trying to say, is that all the children need to be raised, even the light-skinned ones need to be raised to love chocolate, to see. And then, before you know it, we will all be chocolate again. We don't have to really systematically pinpoint how are we going to get rid of these light-skinned people. I just don't feel good about that. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're going to be okay with uh, in the last, I think we only have you for 23 minutes, but uh, assuming people can hear it, if you're okay with taking callers, I do want people to know that we are speaking. Oh, with. I'm fine with it. Oh, I'm definitely fine. I mean, if we can do it, I will do it. Excellent. Okay, Station ID, this is Counter Racist Evolving Engineer. We are talking with acclaimed author, novelist, and essayist and activist, Cola Booth, to ask Ms. Booth a question. You may call in at 347-633-9734. One more time, more slowly, 347-633-9734. And you will need to do that within the next 22 minutes. That's what the uh, timer is saying. Uh, While we're waiting for those hands to go up, in terms of getting children programmed and conditioned to see black as worth loving and loving, um, do you think that seeing black males and black females together affectionately is a key part of that? And I, I guess it definitely it, it, is. It definitely. That's what I meant by the music videos and these images that are so against us now. We need to, because not only do we need black women to start being in these videos, and I mean visibly black women, not European-looking black women, but I mean black women. Not only do we need that, but we need to stop showing this whorish image of naked women. What we need to show is, and this can be done, these songs that they write can show affection. It can show a black couple holding hands walking through the park just as easily as it can show a woman bent over in her bikini. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have some of that, but I'm just saying that we need to mix these images up. In the same video where the girl is leaned over in her bikini, we can also show an older black couple waving to someone in a car. We can show a beautiful black mother holding her baby, looking at her baby with love. We can show so many different images in there that affirm us as black people. 
You know, it's not hard to do. White people do everything I'm describing every day in their videos. They have the full rank of humanity in one video. And that's what I'm trying to get black people to see, only we need to do it black style. And um, it's really imperative that we start. I mean, there are, believe it or not, many people starting to talk about this, including some black men, are starting to speak what I am speaking. And um, I know it sounds like, oh, you know, I just don't see it changing, but we have to have hope and we have to do something, something. Because if you love black people, they're not going to be here if we don't do something. They're not going to be here. We are totally falling apart, dying, and you cannot have unity and come in 56 shades. That's another backwards belief that black people have. I'm sorry, but uniformity, you have to have uniformity in order to have unity. And uniformity means that in some way we must all have some kind of badge that is the same, that unites us. We have to look more like each other other than less like each other. And when you have a bunch of people who look like all kinds of things and don't look alike, you cannot expect them to come in a room and just be united. It's not going to happen. It's just not. I am not going to unite with the 2% black woman who's telling me that, you know, her mother is Dutch and because this has happened to me. I had was, you know, this woman, I just couldn't relate to her. I didn't want to be, you know, it just insulted me, the whole idea that they think I should be sisters with her. You know, I just thought, oh, she's European trash, masquerading as a black woman. You know, and I'm very, very snobby like that. And, and black people should be. I mean, I don't, you know, we understand why the black Americans are not. It's because they don't have their tribe anymore. They don't have the clan. They don't have the blood berry like we do. They are not raised uh, the way that we are, where they have a certain amount of protectiveness of their identity. Black Americans have zero of that. I mean zero. They don't even, it's, it's even foreign when you, you know, talk about it to them. They see it as racism. Well, if you are the last four digits, 8601, and you want to ask a question, if you'll press that one, I'll get an indication of that, and uh, I'll be able to uh, put you on the line. I think uh, the the young lady who proposed that is uh, is going to send me a, a a private message so that I can uh, uh, pose whatever question she has for you to, uh, to see an indication that she's come online. Um, but uh, while we're waiting on her, this person has raised their hand, and so if you are eight six. Are Hello? on the air. Do you have a yes? Yes. yes. Who, are we, who are we speaking with? Hi, um, my name is Paula, and I'm calling from Chicago. Um, I have the Twitter handle Groove Parlor TV, and um, I follow Cola on Twitter oh. a lot. And I wanted to um, thank you, Cree, for having her on because she, a lot of people need to hear what she's saying. Um, I also wanted to bring up an issue of not just maybe the doll test, but also we need to watch what our young boys are doing with video games. Um, my uh, seven-year-old nephew likes wrestling, and you can pick a character, pick the hair, pick the skin, and I was really upset when he picked someone white to be white. And I'm like, well, why, why didn't you pick the – and, you know, I tried to temper my anger and ask nicely, well, why didn't you pick the dark-skinned guy? He's like, well, I don't think that's attractive. And he's seven. He said this when he was seven. He's eight now. And I was just floored. And I'm like, okay, there's some work that needs to be done here. Um, and like you, Cola, I started saying, I started calling him, oh, you're such a pretty chocolate boy. You're a beautiful chocolate boy. And, you know, I'm this. I'm actually darker than him. And, um, you know, just to inf re reinforce that whole thing and, Maybe in a few weeks he did pick the dark-skinned guy, and he wasn't ashamed of it anymore. He just had to have, a, you know, be talked to and so forth. And that's very crucial. That is really, really crucial. We not only have to watch the music and maybe the toys, the dolls maybe perhaps, but also the video games because there's racism there too. There's racism there too. And I also want to talk to you about your book and how it – could you talk more about your book and how it relates to – um to your fighting white supremacy and just your experience uh, with it. 
Thank you so much for calling in. I just love you so much. Thank, Thank you, you Carla. So much for calling in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I am um, the sexy part of the Bible deals with um, skin bleaching in West Africa and goes very deep into why these people are doing it. And we've talked about a lot of it here in the surface way. So um, to answer her question, The Sexy Part of the Bible, which is my new book, it deals with a hundred topics. I mean, it's so out there. It has so much going on in it. And basically, I just wanted to affirm our ancestral mother, and I wanted to make the reader feel connected to the black woman in a way that you have not been previously. Um, Basically, I write very different from most American authors. So, um, you know, a lot of the things that I think black American authors focus on, they focus more on what was done to us by outsiders rather than what we do to each other. And in my books, it's the opposite. I My books really focus more on how we treat each other and what we do good and bad to each other. And so a lot of what I've talked about, I think you will encounter in my book that Hopefully, the book is very inspirational and uplifting to black people, and most of them say that it it really is, and I'm so happy that, um, well, in my books, I always have a happy ending, and so um, there's triumph for us in finding ourselves. The closer that we get to our authentic selves, there's triumph for us, and so that's what I wanted to show with the sexy part of the Bible. It's also extremely entertaining. I mean, I'm not all just politics, you know, and um, I'm just so happy that she wanted me to mention the book and that so many women who've read it feel so passionate about it. It took me four years to write that particular book. It's my 10th book, and um, so much went into that book. It's just very emotional. You would have to read it to really understand what I'm saying. Wow. I'm glad that she she remembered to ask about it because, well, you know, I wanted to make sure that I asked about it and she actually did my job for me. Thank you. Uh, If you would, I mean, we might be able to come back around to you. Uh, We do have two other callers. Uh, Well, now just one. Okay. No problem. If your last four digits are, thank you. If your last four digits are 7673, you'd be on the air if you have a question for Cole Booth. Hi, good evening, Cree. Good evening, Cola. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Yes. Um, Cola, can you please tell us more about your religion? I think you called it the womb religion. Yes, the womb, W-O-M-E. Uh-huh. And I wanted something safe for women. I really don't like Islam at all, and I have no qualms about saying it. I just found Islam. Let me just tell you, when I was little, like five years old, it was illegal for me and my father to eat breakfast together in Sudan because of Islam, and so that is the memory I have Islam. I saw men rolled up in a carpet and gasoline poured over her, and she was set on fire by her husband and his brothers because she had six girls in a row and no boys. And so that is how I think of Islam, and that is why I have never liked the religion, and, you know, I'm just being frank. And then Christianity, I have a lot of problems with that, too, Um The womb is my religion that, you know, I so believe in everything everyone else believes in. I just believe that our purpose is to heal each other, hopefully. I feel that our purpose is for each human being to heal each other and for us to have love for each other and to have compassion. I don't believe in sin. I believe we make mistakes, and our life is about learning from those mistakes and hopefully not only not making those mistakes again, but teaching others, you know, the mistake you made and not to fall into that trap. And uh, most of all, I don't like to preach at people or to tell people that they are not good enough or that they are bad or, you know, I wanted, you know, I really believe, hopefully, and this is hard even for me, but I, I, I really want to give love. I want to love people more and love myself more, and teach my children to be loving, caring men. I want them to really respect women. That's a biggie with me, with my sons. As much as I teach them to love being black men, I have also really worked overtime 
on the whole sexism thing because their father is sexist. And I don't talk against him, but what I do is show my sons every day why it is so important that they must admire and value and uphold women. To me, God is, you know, man and woman are two halves of the same thought. That is what God is. And so you cannot love man and not love woman. You cannot respect man and not respect woman. You cannot value a man and not value the womb that he came from. Like I tell them, you cannot save a man if you cannot save the womb that produced him. You'll never save him. And so, you know, I just want so much for my seconds to have a more open view of the world. I want them to be proud to be black men. I want them to covet their blackness and to protect black women. But at the same time, I also want them to have compassion and good spirits for the whole world, for everybody, for animals. You know, I believe in the environment. The womb is really mothering. You know, in Africa we have a saying that she gave him a mothering or she gave these people a mothering, and I feel that is what we as humans need to practice more, is mothering the earth. I mean, the soil that we grow things from, the animals, the plants, the air, we have to become much more conscious of our responsibility to, to me, take care of this world. And so, you know, the womb just goes through all of that kind of idealism. And I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying that I'm God or anything like that. I'm not even, to be honest with you, saying that I believe in God. I'm just saying that this is how I would want to live and give. And I just think that we all should be living and giving some way positive. So... For me, I just want to get away from the didacticism of religion and get closer to the actual spirituality that I found as a human being. And after giving birth, that religion is when it came to me. I just felt so close to my sons and so gifted. I just felt like, boy, this is really a gift. I actually wanted to live now because I had these sons. And um, I just felt so much love and like, you know, wow, this is what it's about is is trying to give love. So like I said, I may not be right and or perfect, but that's what the womb is for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for, for asking the question. If you want to hold on, we probably will have a little time to come back around to you. Okay. I will. Uh, but I'm okay. Oh, I'm glad you're still there. I thought we lost you. No, no, no. Probably I Paula talks so much. <laughs> no, no um, the the young lady who proposed the code that I was telling you about wanted to call in, but she uh, was unable, so she just texted me, texted her uh, her question. And so here it is. Uh, this is the question from Tater Pie. The dark parent, oops, starting in the middle of the question. Here we go. Dark skin is not dominant. If dark-skinned people mate with a paler shade, it would most likely produce an in-between shade of the darker parent and the lighter parent. In the area of the world known as America, if black people keep procreating with lighter shades with looser hair, what would be the value in teaching that dark skin and woolly hair is beautiful and great if it is breeded out of existence. That's the question. I'm not sure well, that I, I understood the last she's right. Well, no, I hope she's right. I hope she's listening because I agree with her on that. Um, that's what I meant when I was saying that by the time we get through fighting colorism and planting all these seeds, so many years will have gone by, I wonder if it will matter. That's what I meant, is that by that time there will have been so much mixing and so much gradation until we will have taught them to love something that is no longer there. And so um, I understand what she's saying, and I agree with her on that. And I don't know what the answer is as far as You know, I I, I understand what she's saying, but I still don't think that I could go out publicly and tell people, you must make darker. Um, 
I think I would try to show people that, and that is what my work does, actually, is she would read my books. I think she will see that I kind of lead people to that, what she's saying, in my storylines and my love stories. And I have light-skinned people in there and, you know, so on and so forth. I think she would see that I wish that could be. But I don't know how I could actually go out and preach that we should do that. And um, I'm not comfortable with that totally. But I do agree with what she's saying, is that, you know, it doesn't produce darker. It produces a, a medium between the two. And, you know, I don't know what else to... I think I'm doing the right work, though. I have to say that. I think the books I write and that the work I do is helping. And I think that... Um, I think I'm on the right track. I definitely don't see how what you're doing is counter to um, counter to the effort to keep us here. Um, right. No, I, I, I don't at all. Uh, I, I think that, uh, that, that we had we had so many problems uh, with the with the broadcast that we only have like five minutes left. I don't I don't want to take up any more time if the, if the callers want to ask you more questions. So um, if eight six zero one, if you had a, another question or a comment, your mic is open. Okay, um, I wanted to. Um, basically um say that cola you know i agree with what you're saying and um i don't know if you remember how we had talked on twitter about the nasty little things that black people do to each other when a baby is born about checking the ears and the to see maybe what color they'll be down the line and so forth i hadn't had that experience until i was in college and the person i was dating there was a newborn baby in the family, and I, I was just totally floored because my family never did that. Um, I never experienced that. And I think, um, you know, when I said something um, that really didn't sit very well with the family, I think more people have to speak up when uh, perhaps their loved ones right. or their family members do things like that. Um, and I don't know, how, what would you advise someone who's maybe um, who's awake, perhaps, uh, dealing with their family members who perhaps still have this, you know, deep-seated colorism and self-hate? That is the hardest thing to do because I've done it, and it, it's very difficult because everyone's against you. Yeah. Usually you're the only one who will be dissenting, and even if the other ones agree with you, they will make it out that you're making a big fuss over nothing. Mm. And we're so not used to uh, doing it until, um, and, you know, people are so used to not being challenged until it's very ugly. I've done it all my life. I have challenged, and, you know, my black American family, I mean, there's eight children and so many uncles and aunts and cousins, and so I was constantly, constantly uh, challenging people over issues of colorism and comments they would make, and I was never really understood or, you know, they understand you from a brutal, you know, they feel attacked, but it's necessary to do it. If you have the courage to do it, it is necessary to do it. And one thing that is happening now, I'm now 42 years old, I find that more people are joining me now. It used to be I was the only one. But now I notice when I have situations like at a party or something and I say, oh, you know, that's completely color or whatever, there's like three or four other people who jump on my side now. That's good. And so I've noticed it's becoming, yeah, it's starting to change as far as more people aware and vocal. When you are vocal about it, you give other people permission to be vocal, and that's what my book do. Many book women who would never discuss this subject before they always write to me saying, after reading your books, I now talk about this openly. And so that's a huge part of it that um, it's starting to change is that the more – I heard a Lauren Hill record. It was a duet she did with John Legend. And in the song, she was talking about what a beautiful black queen she is and all this stuff about her complexion and, you know, chocolate women and all this. And so now it is starting to become part of the uh, conversation now. There are people now who are not. So I think it's going to get better, and, and we just need to do it. It's very difficult to do because it makes you unpopular. But um, we have to be willing to be unpopular and to wake people up. 
Well, thank, thank you, you for Carla. your follow-up question. Thank you, Cree. Thanks. So thank you for calling. Uh, I'm actually not hanging up on you. Uh, just hang, we might be able to get one more in from you if you had one, but I want to give 7673 a, a chance. Okay. Hello? I'm a, there you are. There you are. 7673, did you have a, another question or comment? Yes, I did. Um, Cola, could you tell us about um, how you went about getting published and do, could you give advice to black people who are trying to get published? Because I know it's uh, it's a very difficult process. Oh, boy, I'm just going to be totally honest with you. I basically had the right connections, meaning men. Um, I was a model, and um, I've always had, like, powerful boyfriends and stuff like that. And so really, to be honest with you, it wasn't really just talent that got me in the door. Um, a lot of it was that I was very passionate and vocal and sort of wild. And so, um, you know, I just had a different way. I think the business is so impossible, and especially right now, it is absolutely just almost hopeless for black just because they literally are not taking anyone. Um, the business is falling apart, literally. So I wish you the best, and I hope that more black writers can get published and get their work out there. But I'm not a good example because, really, I the way that I came up was sort of Diana Ross style. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, no, I know, Curry. What a note to end on. She's a slut. No, 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 come on. You know, uh, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna co-sign on that. Absolutely not. Uh, I don't know what that means. Um, if you if you had time for just one more question, the the there's a follow up from the young lady. Okay. Oh no! So now she's saying that's not her follow up question. Uh, okay. Um, she, she just had an observation, but I guess I'm not sure if she's telling me not to ask this question. I'm going to make a judgment call and say that I don't think she minds if I ask it in the form of a question. Uh, what she is, is saying, and I guess I want to know if you would possibly agree, is that uh, lighter-skinned people, light-skinned people, uh, who are classified as black in this, uh, have, she's observed that they have a much easier time making such suggestions. Uh, compared to people who are, who are darker skinned. And uh, do you feel like uh, it would be of value for, for lighter skinned people to perhaps suggest that as code? And then I guess I'm going to try to sneak in a, a, a second part, which is what if people didn't necessarily try to preach it for other people, but they adopted it as their own personal code and maybe let other people know that that's what they were doing? Would you see that as as something that would be would take easier? But I guess I didn't want to overtake her her yes, observation. I agree with her. Yes, I think that would be a good way because that's how I do it. She just described basically what I do is I tell everybody how I do things, and um, I agree with her. And yes, it is easier for lighter skinned people to do whatever they want to do. There you go. The sexy part of the Bible. Go out and yeah. get it. If you if you liked what she had to say tonight, then you need to support her as a as a an, um, an artist. And she's already described how what we described discussed here tonight is uh, is kind of treated in her book. And don't stop at that text. She has so many incredibly insightful nonfiction and fiction works that uh, and they can get it on Amazon.com too. Did you just say Amazon.com? Yes, they can get it on Amazon.com as well if they want to get the e-book or the actual book. Um, they can order it on Amazon as well as if, you know, the stores. I, and I thought that went without saying, you know. <laughs> uh, you're, you're an acclaimed <laughs> author. Of course they can get you on Amazon. But if you want to just check out some other things by her and uh, just go to colabooth.com. And if you don't know her work, your life's going to be so much richer once you start reading uh, this incredible, credible author and uh, thinker. I just want to thank you so much, Cola, for taking the time to come on, come on our uh, venue here. And uh, I know that I'm going to support your work and follow you. And I just 
as I said to you on uh, you know when I was when I chatted with you via text, I admire your courage because you've been saying it for so long when nobody else was saying it. And I was telling my dad, this person, this woman, she just she says things that nobody else will say, and she keeps saying them. And he he laughed a, a good long while. Thank you for being you. Thank you, and I I hope I'll be back again, and I thank you too. I was going to ask you that, but I was a little bit hesitant to do that, so I was going to try to do that off Oh, no, no, no. You're a wonderful interviewer. You really know yourself, so I would love to. I, I hate the whole phone thing that went on with this phone. So I'm like, God, oh, we need to do this again, you know, without all the interruptions. That I still think is pretty great. Absolutely. Music to my ears. We've got to have you back. Everybody, next time, go out. Buy her books, and we'll we'll have a great time. So good luck on your book tour, and uh, we shall be in touch. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Cola Booth. Cola Booth. Amazing, amazing person. I don't usually fawn over people, um, but I, I just think that she's something special. You know, I, I really do. Um, I... Th- I your your mics are open if you um I've got the mics open for the two callers if you wanted to chat about what you just heard or the subjects that were raised uh we got some time but it just be it would just be you too because uh we're no longer on live stream so um okay well it's it's interesting like i said um I mean I've been reading cola uh, for a while i mean back before twitter before facebook um and it's it's amazing um my parents were very um afrocentric and very uh conscious and i had black baby dolls and it it's 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 interesting they never preached to me about oh don't marry this don't marry that you know um but i realized like the the people that i choose like the men that i choose are all dark skin and i don't think that's an accident i think that is because i grew up with such self love and 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 so forth but then when I get out into the real world, you know, my first adult relationship, like I said, there was a baby born in the family and they're checking the ears. And I'm I'm thinking, like, what is this cult custom? Like, what, where did this come from? I mean, really, it was an assault on the way I was brought up, and I, I just didn't know how to deal. And, and reading Cola actually kind of helped me um, get through it and realize that everything I said, you know, to my um, – would have been in laws, <laughs> you know. I right. mean, I had every right to stay, and it, it's it's crazy. I mean, it's 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 one thing when your family, you know, you don't. I don't hear things like that in the family. I I, I don't even with my um, even with my uh, with my extended family, my aunts, my aunts and uncles and so forth. But with God, with 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 my college sweetheart, it was just horrible. I'm like, oh my God, where did you people come from? You know. <laughs> And the thing, what's really bad is, you know, I'm I'm dark skinned, and, but I have light skinned people in my family, and I never heard them say such things, ever. And I'm just like, what? And and not all of them, not all of my uh, college sweethearts' family were light skinned, but a good majority of the women were, and the men were dark skinned, and the men that they would marry were dark skinned, and I just, whew, that was that was that was a, that was that did my head in for a minute. <laughs> So when I started reading Cola's work and seeing just what she was talking about and how passionate she was, I don't call it anger so much as I call it passion. I was like, okay, finally, I have somebody who thinks like me, justifies me, who's like my age or my generation, not my mom's or dad's generation. I'm like, okay, I'm I'm not crazy here. There is a reason, you know, why I stood up for myself and stood up for, you know, dark-skinned people. I mean, it was crazy. I... <laughs> You know, I, I I don't I don't even talk to that person anymore. I mean, I don't know them. I don't know their family anymore. It's really it was really painful. But uh, I mean, go figure. Um, I don't I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I'm just really happy that she continues to speak the truth. I mean, I've been reading her since the, maybe the maybe ninety nine two thousand. So go figure. <laughs> You were ahead of the curve. I didn't uh, even become aware of her until I think about 2005. Okay. Um, and 
Yeah, and I didn't even know she was preaching on colorism at that time. I just found out that she, I wouldn't say preaching, I didn't know she spoke so passionately about colorism until two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I had no clue. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, What did I know about her? Uh, I knew that she was a fantastic novelist. Yes. And uh, I guess that's really about it. I, 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 I didn't care about the whole other thing that I don't even want to talk about. You know what I'm talking about. Sure, sure. I didn't care about that. That, that meant nothing to me. Never, yeah, me, never me either. Before. You either? Mm. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, I didn't care about that. Uh, mm. But what I wanted to ask you about, and I haven't had a chance to ask anybody else this before, so okay. here it goes. I've been noticing over the last year mm-hmm. that when people talk about skin color, when black people talk about skin color, they say, well, she's dark skin and he's light skin or he's light skin and he's dark skin. Uh, that's odd to me. I don't know when that changed, but I never hear somebody just say, oh, they're just regular or they're just medium they're not, you know, or they're just brown. I, it's either, it's this bifurcation now of light and dark as if there's like... Interesting. Did you grow? And that's weird to me. And when did that happen? Did I miss the? Did I miss the memorandum? I, I don't get it. Um, well, I mean, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, uh, the the phrases that I heard, I guess because my parents are older, uh, they would never say light skin. They'd say red or yellow, uh, perhaps hmm. or right. Or if they were dark skin, they'd say oh, you know, chocolate or very brown. That so that I think I think now. I think I think maybe that's a symptom of 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 our generation, perhaps maybe, um, and the generation under us, maybe twenties and so forth and so on. I don't I don't know how old you are, Cree, but um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm over forty. Let's just say that, right? Okay, okay sure. No, that's cool. And and yes. but you know, I mean, I honestly think that's just really within the last. 20 years, because my mother hated it when I said light skin. Cause she says, no, don't, don't say that. Say red. Say anything. It, she never liked me saying that because, um, oh. yeah, no. Uh, I, I guess because my mom was like, you know, they're not white. You know, they're, they're still black people. And I guess to be inclusive, you know, she's also from the country too. You know, she, she'd say red. No, they're red. They're they're red or they're brown or they're yellow or they're, you know, but it, um, never light skin. She did not like that. She still, to this day, she does. She cringes when I say that. Really, she does. She does not like that. And, uh, and that I, is I very that. interesting. I have, mm-hmm. I have never heard of anybody tell me that they knew anybody who was was, was opposed to the term light skin. That is so interesting. Like, was she is she opposed to the term dark skinned? Um, no, no. I mean, she that's that's fine with her, but but just to say light skinned, it's oh she mm, she she doesn't like that. And I like I said, she said I'd, I'd rather say red. I'd r- rather you say red, or you'd rather say yellow, or something like that, but not light skin because that that I guess it's very subjective. And and I like I said, I, I I've it's hard for me to bring it up with her, but um, I mean, this is a woman who is chocolate just like me. <laughs> and and. Yeah, it's. I, I think she thinks it is divisive, from what I get. I think she she sees that as divisive. I, I don't know, but um, it's funny. Um, her one of her sisters who passed away is is her mirror, but she is um lighter skinned or red, as she will, as she would describe her. And um, it, it's funny. I mean, I never heard her say anything bad about light skinned people ever, ever. You know, but um. She would tell me that, look, you need to, I guess as I got older, um, she would tell me why people hate their hair, why people hate their skin complexion, why people use the bleach and, and so forth and so on. And, you know, she would explain to me that, like, the guy, the, the little guy who shaved his head because he doesn't want his father's hair to show, um, she would tell me about stuff like that, perhaps, but maybe something different, Um uh, maybe different scenarios, and she would wow. tell, yeah, and she'd say, "Look, that that's really not, that's really not a healthy way of thinking, or whatever they're doing is not healthy." So, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, like I said, I I I can't imagine what 
from their from their perspective, I can't imagine what they had to go through raising me in the 70s and the 80s and countering a lot of messages that were in the media and so forth and so on. So, you know, but I see, and, and, I don't but, even, go ahead. No, but I was going to say, but it's been successful. So, yeah. you know, in, in the way that, that uh, Cola was talking about what could be done so that it would have the correct effect later That's on true. in their lives, your evidence that it worked. It, it does work. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you something else. My mother uh, um, and dad specifically did not want me watching um, perhaps white supremacist um, stories. Uh, uh, we were not allowed to watch Westerns at all. The first Western that I saw was Dances with Wolves. Okay. Um, she said, I do, and I, and I asked, I'm like, Mom, why, why can't I watch this cowboy movie? She's like, no. She says, I do not want you seeing the white man subjugating Indians and, um, and, and thinking that what they did to that nation was right because it wasn't. It's propaganda and, you'll, and you won't watch it. We were forbidden to watch it. Seriously. I mean, my, 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 my dad, he loved gun smoke. We had to leave the room. We're like, okay, time to go. Bye. <laughs> I mean, there was just no and, – and I was too young to – I mean, when I got older, I asked her. But I'm like, okay, I, I can see that. But when I'm when I'm four or five years old, you know, I'm thinking, oh, it's violent. They don't want me watching it. But as when I got older, that's when she told me I didn't want the reason why I didn't want you watching westerns was because of this. And and I I totally agree. I I don't have children, but I have a nephew and nieces, and they can't watch BET at my house. They uh, can't. I don't want to be a. a- I don't want to be a poor host, so mm-hmm. seven six seven three. Your mic is open. I don't know if you know that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I talk too much. <laughs> no, no, I no, 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 no. I I just wanted to make sure that the other caller knew that her mic was open. Are you Are you still there? Seven six seven three. Yeah, I'm. I'm here. It's just kind of hard to talk because I'm. I'm working out while I'm listening. Oh, I see. Okay, oh, I know okay. your voice. Uh, I know. Why do I know your voice? I, I, what? I think we maybe you're out. Got it. Got it. Yeah, you're, you have a very distinctive voice. Just uh, I, don't, I don't know if you want to give your handle, but I just wanted to let you know that I do know your voice. Um, but I, I recognize that you're working, so that's that's good. Now, <clears throat> to carry on the, 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 the conversation where we were, it's like uh, the divisiveness of using the term light skin, I totally understand that because I think that's where it's gotten to where people can't, describe what they're seeing with their eyes, but rather it's just a straight political division. Yeah. So whereas, you, you see, I mean, cause color comes in a range. It isn't just, you know, light or dark. It's, it's a range with tones to it. It definitely. So, it, so if you're seeing what you, if you are seeing what you're looking at without putting, without putting or to a much less degree putting a value, a political value of it on it, you would describe that range. But because color has become so politicized, and from what Cola is saying, what is happening here is what happened in Sudan, that it becomes either you have the value of being light or you don't. And yeah. so it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything to describe any in-betweens. Either you can be treated as a higher valued person, i.e., a light, lighter skinned mm-hmm. black person, a light skinned black person, or you can't, and that's all that matters. Right, right, and that's divisive. And, uh, that and that's I can, I, and that is. Go ahead. I gotta let you know that when I had to go to the cell phone, when I had to go to the cell phone in order to finish the show, mm-hmm. I'm on a really, uh, I'm on a, I'm on a. I'm on a Negro phone. It's a, okay. It's just, no problem. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk. It's it's cricket, so it's got a delay, so it sounds yeah. like I I don't know how to listen to people. So just to let you know, I'm not doing it on purpose. No, no, no. That's fine. That's perfect. I understand. I understand. But no, I I my mother doesn't. She does not like it when I say that, and that's fine. You know, that's I I honor that. I respect that. Um, but I, I'm telling you, it is. Um, and there are degrees, like you said, there are de- degrees in different shades. I mean, uh, my college sweetheart was one of the darkest in his family, but he was by no means dark as I was, as as dark as I was. And so, okay, I mean, really, honestly, it's all relative to your situation. It really is. Yeah. I mean, there are people that I know that are far darker than me, and they really don't consider me dark-skinned. They're like, no, you're... 
kind of medium brown, you know, if you put me next to someone, charcoal or blue black, that is the truth. And so, yeah, so my mom never, no, she's, mm -mm, don't say that. Please don't say that. Please don't say that. I mean, it's just, mm -mm. it it, it just curdled her blood. (laughs) She hated it, but... um, but no, I, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you had her on and um that if you if you have her on again, I will follow you. I don't know if you have a Twitter ha- you have a Twitter handle, I will follow you on Twitter. I definitely please at reply me when she's back on again, please. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, I will have to get more into Twitter, but uh okay. All right. Uh yes. I will get yeah. And Cree, will you are you archiving the show? Oh yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. It will stay okay. up. Um, oh, wonderful! Are you do you do you visit Blog Talk Radio very often? Do you kind of know how it works? Or I do, yes. Okay, so you wanted to know whether or not this is going to be one of the ones that I take off? No, definitely yeah. will okay. not. Be. Okay. <laughs> gonna <get>. Definitely. <laughs> definitely going to say, uh, assuming that the usual suspects don't do something strange to it. Right. You know, exactly. Um, of course. Of course. I don't think so. Yeah. Though. It's uh. Mm-hmm. And on this color thing, you know, just what you were saying is. I, my, um, it works, you know, if your parents don't make issues out of it. And mm-hmm. I guess where I would begin with it is that I, I like, as I told Cola, I can't believe that we've got 20 and 30 year old people still talking this nonsense. It just, mm-hmm. I remember when I was, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I'm 40 plus, but I remember when I was teaching high school mm-hmm. for the first time in the 80s. And uh, I was so excited. You know, I had this engineering degree, but I chose, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to right, help sure. People. <laughs> so I go, I go to math. I'll tell, I'll tell the name of the high school, John C. Fremont High School, which was okay. in the hood, and I was so happy, right? Okay. In the days, it was, at, at that time, it was 60%, the student body 60% black. Okay. And I'm so happy to be there. And uh, I remember sometime around, I don't know, November or something, somebody pulled out a yearbook from the previous year. Mm-hmm. And there was, and and they had their just best in there, the senior best, and there was a page there that said, "No, what that wasn't it. It was they were voting for prom king and queen." Sure. Now this is in the mid '80s, mm-hmm. and they had two categories. They this is at a high school that was historically black, and they had wow. two categories, and they said dark and lovely, and light and luscious, and that blew my wow. mind. I couldn't. I thought we were going. I thought I had stepped back into the 1940s. Wow. So if I was flabbergasted then, 30, yeah. you know, however many years that, if I was flab- flabbergasted almost 30 years ago, mm-hmm. can you imagine that I can't? Do you understand how I cannot get that this is still here now among yes. young people today? I just I, I can't wrap can my mind that. around it. I can get that. I I totally see that. Wow, wow. And what 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 uh, what city was this in actually? Oh, Los Angeles. Yeah, John C. Fremont High School is, is very, very famous because it was on that uh, Black in America. It was oh, the main uh, yes. high school. That- I remember now. <gasps> oh my god! But that used to be most. That used to be an all-black high school, so you can see how things have changed. You know, wow. it's just. Uh, um, it, I I just I I can't wrap my mind around it, and I just like wow. my uh, my husband. See, I didn't think of him as. I really didn't. I mean, I knew him for a long time before we started actually dating. Sure. And, uh, you know, this is a second marriage. And uh, I didn't, I, it never crossed my mind that he was light-skinned. Because light-skinned to me, you have to be really light for me to sure. think of you as light-skinned. Sure. <laughs> and uh, that's because when I was growing up, there was a range of colors, and the average color of black people was much darker. Yeah. This is what people don't see about how we're, we're bleeding the color out of us, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. Every generation, as Cola says, does get some does get lighter and lighter. Yeah. So I never thought of him as light-skinned. And something happened when we were just talking or something, and he was talking about how he gets uh, he gets suspected of having it easy by black males because he's light-skinned. And we've been dating probably for about a year by the time I came up, and I said, what? And I started laughing. Wow. I'm like, you're not light-skinned. Are you kidding me? You're not light-skinned. Right. I never thought of, yeah, I, light-skinned. Are you kidding? I was like, right. and I, I thought he was around my color. But, no, I, I just scientifically went around and started asking people. And, and what's interesting is that nobody in my family, including my nieces, my nephews and nieces, and they are, my nephews and nieces are uh 
well, they're in this. They're actually quadroons, but in this country they're called mulattoes. They're very okay. light skinned. Sure. Okay, but they didn't think he was light skinned. Nobody who's darker in my family thought he was light. But nobody in my family, my blood relatives, none of them thought he was light skinned. But my mom's. Her, her husband, so I'm not blood related to her husband's family. I asked them, and I'm like, "Is he light skinned? They're younger, and they, oh yeah, 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 yeah he's light skinned." So I, I'm having to reframe how I see things because I want to be seeing what other people are seeing. But what I do know is that the reason I don't see it the way a lot of people see it is strictly because I'm older, and yeah. we've yeah. gotten better. Yeah, so lighter. I mean, we've gotten lighter. Yes, very much so. I agree. I totally agree. Wow. That's that's amazing. That's that's amazing. I <laughs> I'm glad you told that story. I, I am. Wow. Wow. But yeah, I go figure. I, I don't know. Um I'm I'm hoping that more people read her books. I'm hoping that more people um there was this um uh, movement on Facebook of um, Boycott BET or something like that. I can't remember exactly when it started. I think it was August 1st. But um, there are people that are very upset at BET and now are starting to mobilize via social media. So who knows? I mean, perhaps things will change. I mean, I um, I, I don't know that it will. Uh, I'm a media maker myself. I, I uh, interview people and so forth and so on. And I, and I will interview Cola when she comes to Chicago. I missed her the last time. <laughs> but, um, oh. yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, I, I, I think, honestly, it will start when – People um, make movies, television shows, and perhaps uh, videos that, um, like Cola said, I mean, it'll take it'll take other people doing it. It won't take maybe perhaps the people, the black people that are in power, because the black people that are in power are they just want to keep their jobs. They do, and well, then that's the issue. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to ask her and ask you since you're in media. Yes, I wanted to ask her. She's in the business. Yeah. This idea of us needing to to have imagery that shows the full range of our mm-hmm. our uh, our humanness, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word, sure. in a codified way, I usually don't like to use that term, but that full range. How do you do that in the context of a dominating system? Whereby, I mean, I guess I wanted to ask her: Does she really think white people will allow us to do that? Uh, no. I I I think perhaps um well I think perhaps if enough pe- black people complained they would they would and they'd be like okay we can't sell them this bit of good, bill of goods anymore because the people they know what they're doing they really know what they're do- they, they they know what they're doing and it's just so natural to them that for them to do something else is 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 kind of foreign um I've I've been told um I mean, I've never wanted to be an actress. I don't know why it, people are like, oh, you have been a great actress. I'm like, no, no, because I didn't want to go through that whole thing. I I chose to become a director, an editor, and make my own media. And um, thank God for YouTube because you can get paid now <laughs> from ads and, and popularity. Uh-huh. And, and it's it's crazy, but, um, um, I mean, I've heard horror stories of, of casting people um pe- casting people uh, this casting director who's not even black she's Puerto Rican and she said um oh I can tell you stories of how I will send them bl- dark skinned black girls and they'll get dismissed immediately like they'll just tell all the black the dark skinned girls nope and I mean and this was maybe 12 13 years ago and it's 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 crazy it's really crazy I mean just how bad it is just how bad it is. I mean, it's. I mean, Los Angeles, as far as the, I, it's a cess, It's in New York too, more so. But Los Angeles is really a cesspool of white supremacy. <laughs> it really is mm-hmm. when it comes to yeah, media and image. I mean, it's. I mean, this is so great. I mean, how great is this that you have your own show on Blog Talk Radio? This is excellent. This is wonderful. This this maybe this opportunity didn't exist perhaps ten years ago. Maybe only within the last five or something, and and the same thing with YouTube. YouTube, 2005. It's only six years old. I mean, we can now control what we see. We can now at least um, have some options 
and so forth. Um, I mean, I remember working for a television station and working um, in public affairs programming and not wanting to do news because I did not want to report another Negro kills another Negro. I, I couldn't. I'm sorry. I couldn't do that. I just couldn't do that. I couldn't sit there editing that stuff, even if I wasn't on air talent. I couldn't sit there editing that stuff all day. I couldn't. <laughs> you know, I really couldn't. I chose public affairs because you have a longer time to tell a story. You know, instead of maybe five minutes, you know, you have at least a half hour to have a couple of guests on and so forth and so on. Okay. But, yeah. But, um, if, mm-hmm. if, well, if, but, but I guess there has to be a movement that started. It's like how do you do a chicken or egg because you, somehow we've got to get parents to expose their children more uh, consciously. Um, and I don't mean conscious in the political way. I just mean be more particular and more deliberate, I guess is the better term, sure. more deliberate about what they expose their parents, their kids to, and don't just sit them in front of the TV. Only let them see the things that you have already watched and vetted. You yeah. too, listen to that, you know, those kinds. But how do you, it's like, how do you start a movement to get black parents to do that without also having some media that promotes it? And I don't know which comes first. How is that done? Sure, sure. I mean, I... That's something we're going to have to figure out. I mean, I know social media can be a very effective tool, um, and it, I can see people doing something on YouTube. I mean, I wish Cola would actually do um, more YouTube videos. I mean, she'd actually be very popular. She would well, she actually sure be would. Yeah. She'd be very popular. It's just that I, I don't know. She has the means I, as far as money. I just don't know if she has the the people um, in her life to do that or if she knows how or um, because, I mean, that can be embedded in a blog. I mean, I do plan to, um, like your talk show, I'm definitely putting this up on Twitter. I'm definitely going to put this up on Facebook because there are people I know right. who Wonderful. missed it. And they're like, oh, God, hopefully she archives it. I'm like, I'm sure she will. I'm sure she will. <laughs> Yeah, you know. for sure, for sure, for sure. You know, but yes, I mean, it could start with because I've seen some really great things on YouTube and just how people. Uh, oh, perhaps. Oh, and I'll give you an example. Um, do you recall the ad? It was an was it an axe ad or something? I I can't remember. Are you kidding? I have all of them. I ha- are you talking about axe? Is that the one you're talking about? The or one, a particular one in axe. The one. The one where. Um, it said re-civilize yourself. I don't know if it was. I don't know if that was the product. Um, where oh, a no, man it was Nivea. 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 Thank you, Nivea. That and how people were outraged. People were outraged. That's true. And yeah. Within what? Maybe two days. The company's like, okay, okay, we're sorry. We didn't mean for it to be perceived as that. And, I mean, we literally did not think it would harm, you know, it would offend people, but obviously it did, and we're going to remove it. So I, I think social media is a very effective tool to to um, to do this. I really do. Um, because, I mean, I saw it on a blog. I passed it on. I mean, there's so many people that retweeted that thing. And then the apology, um, I I caught that on Twitter. Because somebody's like, hey, did you hear they're apologizing and they're removing the ad? Oh, okay. I mean, so I think social media is really effective. I, honestly, I think we can do that. I mean, come on. I mean, do you see all of the, quote, black trending topics that are like comedy and nonsense, right? I mean, <laughs> you see that. Yeah, you see, yeah. I, I read the hashtags. I read the, you know, you know, you can't be my boyfriend if or something like that. I mean, you know that's an urban thing. You know a lot of black people start that. Okay. If if we can if we can Twitter and make comedy and nonsense trend, why can't we do that with something that matters? Like what you are discussing, what Cola is discussing. Easily. Easily. We can easily do well, that. You would know how to do that. I'm Pardon. very heartened I'm very heartened that you listen to this and that you're talking to me about this because I wouldn't know that. I would be more discouraged thinking I can't figure out a way to get this out of the cellar. Um, so to know that there's that, that catalyst, you know, that, that, that you exist and that people like you exist who know how to bridge those two sure. worlds, if you will, makes sure. me so much more encouraged. 
so much oh, more encouraged. Thank you. And I'm going to tell you something else. There are a lot of black people that access media on their phones first. Okay, like say, for instance, perhaps um, maybe they don't have the Internet at home, but they have a smartphone. Okay, if they see this broadcast and like, oh, wow, I'm not home or I don't have the Internet in my house, but I have it at school or the library or work, what I'll do is I'll save this tweet and I'll make sure I look at this tomorrow. Because, uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, there was something um, that I oh I I, I uploaded because I, I I come from I come from traditional television and I started my own access show before I left traditional broadcast television and so that's that's my background just to give you a, um, a just to give you a, like a hint and then. Um, there was an archived interview that I had of Method Man and Red Man from maybe 1999, and it was funny, and it was, it, but but and it was, I don't know, it was uh, they were discussing their new albums at the time, and I put it on Bossip just to talk about it because uh, just to talk about them in general, and one of the leading hip hop blogs picked it up. All of a sudden, I'm getting all these hits. I mean, I only had 500 hits on this, on this, on this thing, and all of a sudden. I had 3,000 hits. I'm like, where is this coming from? And I couldn't get the data from where it was coming from until a few days later because YouTube doesn't um, update the source of this is why people clicked on this video. Um, all, all of that data is, is maybe a 24 to 48 hour delay. And what it was, um, people, you know, whoever picked it up from Bossip put it on Na Right, which is like his leading hip hop blog. But I noticed a surge from Sunday night to Monday morning when people return to school, return to work, and so forth. So, I, 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 like I said, I think that's really, I think that's really um, encouraging that even if somebody misses this show, they can go back and look uh -huh. at, listen to it or look at it. And if you put it on the right blogs, if you um, – Tweeted to the right people, and Cola knows how to work the blogs. Like she'll she'll go to the gossip and 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 lifestyle and culture blogs in our black community, in, in our community. Uh, Nicole Bitchy, Miss Gia, all of those types of 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 blogs, um, and 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 put links there. I mean, it's 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 really it's really something, but. Yeah, it can be taken out of the basement. And if you just know how to tweet it, how to Facebook it, how to make sure that people um, people see it. And then also know your audience. I mean, if you know your audience perhaps uh, will listen to this while they're at work, okay, well then put it up tomorrow maybe between the hours of 9 and oh, maybe 7 and 9 because maybe they'll look at it before they go to work, the ones that have the Internet. And the ones that don't have the Internet, once they get to work or school, they can look at it then. You know, it's just a matter of knowing when your um, when your your audience or your prospective audience tunes in. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, the wealth of stuff that you've just said just now is like uh, okay. this is a whole new. Uh, um, uh, let me give you my email and hopefully sure. you could just say hello. I talk. Okay, it's uh, just my Cree seven all letters dot gmail dot com. Hold on, give me one second. I'd love to stay in touch. I'm on Cree 7. All right, and that's letters. At Gmail. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, I, yeah, I'm GrooveParlorTV at gmail.com. Right. Your expertise, are people always trying to hawk it and get it for free? Um, yes, but you know what? I've built yeah. quite a clientele. Um, of people, I have I have two clients now, and I tweet their stuff. I tweet their they're actually in music, and uh, well, one's a party promoter, and one is a record store that puts out compilations on a label in Europe. Okay, and I and let me tell you, I got um um I don't know if you remember the '80s pop band Duran. I'm sure you do, Duran Duran. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. He, I, I I like them, and I follow one of their members on Twitter. And he was speaking on disco and how he's really listening to like seventy, uh, early, like mid seventies disco, uh, T, a lot of TK, the Loft classics, and so forth. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if you'd like my clients, um, my clients um, 
rare disco classic um, album. It's out now on on BBE, a British label actually. And what it is, it's um, a very obscure Chicago and Midwest based disco that really, really never got um, their due in the day. Um, but now they bought the rights, they bought the masters and everything, and they're putting it out in a, in a compilation. Well, I just tweeted, I'm like, hey, if you like disco, check out this rare disco compilation by two guys from Chicago out on BBE. I'm sure he'd know what BBE was because it's a British label, and you know he's a Brit, obviously. Um, I didn't expect him to retweet it. He has 25,000 wow. followers. Right. Oh, my God. Exactly. This is a matter of catching him when he's online. And I'm like, okay. And 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 I'll, I'll tell you something else that I did um, for 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 one of my clips. I interviewed Gangstar maybe like 2003. One of their um, one of course one of their members passed away, uh, Guru last year. And I'm like, you know, let me dig that out of the archives and stick that on YouTube because I, that really needs to be up there. And I did. And um, the the same blog that posted my Red Man Method Man interview, I just waited until I saw the that same guy online, and I'm like, hey, could you? Um, I have this Gangstar interview from 2003 from their last tour. You know, you think you may be interested in this? And I just kept kind of hounding him, like maybe for a couple of days. Finally, he put it up, and actually, he wrote something really nice about. It. He says this. It's perhaps one of the last interviews they did. Well, I, I can't speak on that. I don't know if it was the last interview, the very last interview they did as a group because they broke up after that tour. But um, it got a lot of traction. I mean, that 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 video has 10,000 views almost, all because of that blog that's very influential. So, yes. So I, I, I definitely... <laughs> Let's put it this way. Um, the people that pay me to do this, and like I said, I only have two clients because I do other things. I, I, I'm a videotape editor. I, I'm a freelance videotape editor. I do my own work as well, and I do the social media and marketing for these two clients. Um, I mean, so my schedule is, is, is pretty full, but, I mean, I am very effective at what I do. I'm very effective at what I do. And I don't mind giving you this information for free because... I think, you know, you could go a long way with it and it's just it's just something that I don't know. How should I how should I say this? Um if you learned how to work Twitter and Facebook more effectively, oh you get a lot of listeners. You would because there are people looking for this. And you obviously know how to pick I guess I gotta... interesting and engaging guests. You obviously know how to do that. Because you got Cola Booth. You got her to say yes. I mean <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I mean that's that's you know, and she was ranting about the Cherokees and and what they did. I mean, I, I and it's 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 really interesting. It's very very interesting how the how this just all snowballed into. Hey, I'm going to be on 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 Blog Talk Radio. Uh, mm-hmm. I am listening. I need to learn it. I need to learn it as fast as I can. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I just thank you so so much. I mean, You're welcome. You're welcome. I mean, obviously, so, we'll be talking in the future, and I will be tuning in, and we will be emailing each other. Definitely stay on Twitter, Cree. I'm I'm so serious because there are people who are looking for what you produce. They are. I mean, it's out of the basement. Okay. As far as I'm concerned, it's out of the basement. If you if if I can get this on my smartphone and on the computer and such, I, it's out of the basement. It's already out of the basement. You just have to know who to get to. And honestly, um, a lot of young girls who follow Cola, they need to hear what you what you're saying. They need to do that. Wow. So yeah, I mean, th- there's that that's a good portion of your audience. Another audience, oh, women like me and you, 30s, 40 ish, that yeah. agree with what you're saying and just need a platform to speak and say, you know what? I thought I was the only one. I'm glad, you know, just to find that common bond. But the young girls are really listening. They're really hungry for what she has to say. There's young black girls who are really wanting to hear her. Is that your sense? That is my sense. She she tells me that um, a lot of young black girls contact her via email and so forth and how they um, 
you know, it's just I'm I'm so glad that you're saying what you're saying because maybe they do, they didn't have the support that you had or I had with the family, um, oh, or maybe or didn't have the education um, consciousness that that they had. I mean, one woman told me who is my complexion that she's not African. I'm like what are you talking about? She's like, well, Haley's an Irish name. I'm like, okay, but you're not Irish. Clearly you are black and you, your ancestors were slaves and they came from Africa. And, and she said, you know, I, you know I'm, I, I'm not African. I'm like, well, do you consider yourself African American? Or what? And she says, you know, I, she says, she says I, I'm, just, I'm just black. I'm like, well, what is that? And she really couldn't tell me. And this woman is like 20, 22 years old. And she was raised by her like grandma. Yes. Hello? No, Go I ahead. Guess what I was going to, well, I guess what I was going to say is that um, until we scientifically learn how to keep the progress that we've made through education, through when I say education, I mean studying the problem and the solutions, mm-hmm. um, we're going to keep, keep recycling. We're going to make progress, and then we're going to go back. So it's like it seems like it's it's no more than just 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 from this program alone and then uh, watching the thing by Melvin Van Peebles, it seems like it's like a 20-year cycle because watching that program he did on a retrospective of black film, black cinema, it's like this started with Birth of a Nation and the cycle was maybe about 20 or 30 years and then it was back to square one. Exactly. And I guess I've been around, and I guess I've been around long enough to see it myself now. So it's like it's almost, it's not enough to know what you're talking about and to be able to, to, you know, clarify it and speak about it. You got to know how to preserve it. And I think that your skill set, pe- we, we need to really find the people with your skill set because sure. unless we know how to put that into, mm, I don't know, you know, a way that we can reach for it and grab it and keep it alive through through some sort of media, we're just going to be keep going through the cycle. And I think white people know that, that they don't, they're not even concerned about us getting smarter anymore because they know we're just going to get dumb again in 25 years. Exactly. Exa- true. Very true. Very true. And like I said, if we can use Twitter and Facebook to promote comedy and nonsense, seriously, I mean, we can use it for consciousness. Clearly it's working. Clearly, it's working. I mean, I I I never heard of you until Cola tweeted about you. I'm like, I gotta I I gotta call in. I've gotta hear this. And I, I tweeted to all my people. My people were like, Oh my God, I'm not home. Will she please tell her to archive this? I mean, people are hungry for this. They're very hungry for this. You know. And the thing is, wow. yeah, yeah, they are. They are honestly. And I I, I honestly think that social media hopefully can make it last longer or stick, make the message stick so that we don't go through these cycles. Yeah, because we went through a consciousness cycle in the late 80s, early 90s. I remember that. And then, I don't know, by the time Clinton, Clinton's second term, we got stupid again. <laughs> got stupid again. Right. So it's like basically what, set about 70, we went stupid at about 72 or 73. Mm-hmm. I was just a child then, I won't tell, you know, but sure. uh, we got stupid again about 72 or 73. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the 90s, you're right, I lived through that. So late 80s, early 90s, there was even like, in, you know, that uh, whole uh, Good Lifers, in, even in hip-hop, hip-hop was smart in hip-hop. And, mm-hmm. uh, so, and then we got stupid again by, what, about 95 we got stupid yeah. again? Yes. <laughs> especially with the music, especially with the music. It's like, are you serious? Oh, my God. Yeah. It's, it's now, I course, mean. Of course, this, mm-hmm. we, we can't talk about it outside of the context of white supremacy in the sense that the white people who practice it practice it in a really scientific way, and they know how to make us stupider, more mm-hmm. stupid. But we just got to get smarter about knowing they're doing that. That's true. We got to know they're doing it. We We do. We have to know they're doing it, and we cannot let uh, them dictate our agenda. Oh, by us talking about this, we're we're um, when we speak like this, we're racist. I, I've seen that. Oh my God, you're just promoting racism. It's like no, we're not promoting racism. We're promoting self-preservation. You know, there's nothing, and, and it's funny, Cree. I have a lot of European followers because I tweet a lot about black music in America and 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 especially like black independent music, and it gets a lot of airplay over there. So naturally, I have a lot of white followers. The thing is, like, I've had Greeks and Irish weigh in, like, well, yeah, I can see your point. And they're, like, completely, totally, 100% white. (laughs) 
and they can see my point. I mean, wow. there's a yeah, there's a DJ in Ireland who I speak to and send music to regularly, and he loves Cola. He's like, there's some first class ranting going on with Guru Parlor TV and Cola Booth, and you need to read it. Get but out. he's right, and I I to, I told him I I posted about the young lady who didn't consider herself African. I'm like, you know, oh my gosh, she's as dark as me. She's obviously of African descent, but she doesn't consider herself African. And 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 he chimed in. He's like, whatever happened to say it loud? I'm black and I'm proud. I mean, I'm a white boy, and I know that. I mean, that was a significant. You know, like, didn't she get the message? He was confused. Like, are you kidding me? You know, and and the it's so funny that the music that he grew up liking was the self affirming black music, and he's just like, I don't understand. Why does she think this way? I mean, he's a white boy, and he doesn't get it. So, you know, overseas like people understand us overseas. People understand us and what we're going through and what we're trying to promote. People that are trying to, I guess, reverse this negative trend. It's the white people here that are afraid and want to say, oh, we're promoting racism, we're promoting intolerance. No. You know, I have I have no hatred for my brothers and sisters of a lighter hue. I don't. The red, the yellow, I don't. I mean, I have that in my family. Why? Or how could I hate that? But, you know, my thing is if you take care of the roots, the, which is the darkest of the dark of the black, everything else will be okay. Everything else will be okay. And I, th- and I think that's what... People don't. Some a lot of black people don't get that, but I think white people don't see that either. And they shoot messages like, "Oh, you're being racist. You're being racist." And we have to not be afraid to counter that, you know. And I like the way Cola presents herself. Like she's really bold on Twitter, but she even said, "I'm very nice. I'm very calm in interviews and when I speak to people." And I I could see that. That was I. Yeah. I needed I needed to hear that tonight. I needed to hear your show to make sure that what she was saying on Twitter, you know, that she was really backing up what she said. And it's true. She is very calm and very articulate and not, um, I mean, she can be rather brutal um, on Twitter as far as her words. And I, I get it. She's, she's, she's passionate. You know, but, but her presentation otherwise is, is very calm and very purposeful and, and loving, actually. You know, but it I, like really I said, was. Yes, and I need to hear that. And I'm telling you, please, please tweet the hell out of this archive, please. Okay. Because okay. a lot of okay. people misunderstand I, her, but also, too, it will bring people to your show. Okay. She, yeah, um, she's very both, high profile. Uh, well, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, on, on both accounts. I mean, on both accounts, of course. I'm I'm doing this because I think it's worth hearing because I'm mm-hmm. not getting paid for it. Sure. So it's something that I think people need to hear. So, yes, any advice that you have for me on how to get more people to hear what I think should be heard, I'm mm-hmm. going to take. Um, mm-hmm. By the same token, I think she's saying something that needs to be heard. Obviously, I wouldn't have had her on. Definitely. Um, so, yes, uh, that will do both. And I, will, and I hope, and I'm, I'm sure you will, that mm-hmm. when I have her on again, uh, you will be here. And because uh, a lot of the issues that you've just now raised, it's a, it's a conversation I would like to have again, that I would like to have with her as well. The whole issue of what is racism, you know, yeah. I, I, I find it very useful to say that racism is only white supremacy. And, uh, you know, and there's, and there's, you know, there are issues around that, kind of the use of words that time doesn't permit right now. But sure. really thoughtful people and, and females, black females, um, I think black females rock. And yeah. uh, you, you, you're, proof, you're proof of that. Thank you. Thank you. You rock. Oh, my God. But you're right. I totally agree with you that racism is white supremacy. It really is. It really, it really is. And I, and that that is really the long and short of it. You know, my, my that, father... That's, can't... The only, that's the only functional form of it, so let's not talk about fantasy mm-hmm. racism. The only kind that really exists functionally is white supremacy. So what are you talking about here? Exactly. Exactly. That's correct. That's correct. I totally agree. When you explain it in those terms, any example that you can um, perhaps point to, it all goes back to any racist example that you can that you can point to all goes back to white supremacy. It does. That's Period. Right. I can I cannot think of a of um of a scenario where it wouldn't. I mean, even when I when I would experience racism within my own race as opposed to, you know, the, the, the light and the dark thing. Again, it goes right back to white supremacy. 
Right. That, it's that, just reacting to it. Yeah. Yeah. The the light is better. That the whole thing. I mean, and I like I said when I encountered kids in school that would say certain things, I'm like, why do they feel this way? Because I didn't grow up that way. I'm thinking, don't they like themselves? You know, I'm. It, it's it's just it's just it's just interesting. But yes, I mean. It goes. It all goes back to white supremacy. It does. It does. It does. It does. And I think people need to hear that more. And I think the more perhaps um, authors and guests that you have on that drive that point home, it'll because that's. I mean, that's one of your focus. That's 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 your focus. Is okay. You know about race and so forth and so on. I mean, that's you know, all I do. That's yeah. all I do. That's that's. I just, I'm on. I'm on one. One topic program. That's mm-hmm. and that's really all. That's what. That's how I live. That's my marriage. It's everything. That's, exactly. That's what we do. Mm-hmm. So, um, um, can I have a? Since you're going to be calling in, can you give me yeah. a handle? Uh, a handle? Oh, like what exactly? What should I thing? call you? So when I when I say good night, should I say? Can I can I call you something besides the last four digits of your phone number? Oh you have yes, a, Groove Parlor any- TV. Yes, or Paula, or Groove Parlor TV. My Twitter handle. I always communicate via my Twitter handle. Always. Okay. I actually think I Groove. Posted. Mm-hmm. Groove, Groove Parlor Paula TV. That's correct. Parlor Groove Parlor Groove Parlor TV. Got That's it. correct. Okay. Yes, I think I even posted on your um I posted on your um your your page as as Groove Parlor um. But yes, okay. definitely. De- Tater, I see Tater Pie. That's <laughs> you, she was the uh, the person that couldn't call in. But yeah, right. right. Yeah, but definitely. Well, look, again, I'm sorry, listeners. I'm sorry, caller. I'm sorry, gr- Groove Parlor TV. That this, I've got this Negro phone that makes it uh, makes me bump okay. into people. Um, okay. it's, it is definitely not the way that I would have wanted to end the the program in the last. You know, three and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. But um, I want to thank you, Groove Groove Parlor TV. Check it out, people. That's go correct. go find her on uh, on Twitter. go find her on YouTube and, and Twitter and Facebook. And, uh, follow yeah. the work. Thank you. <laughs> and Facebook. Mm-hmm. Follow what she does. I want to thank you for making the second half of or the last uh, third of this episode rock and really work. And um, we're going to look forward to you, you know, being a, a, a regular part. To the extent that you can yes. of uh, of this, and we want to be a, we want to be a part of what you're doing. Thank and, you, uh, you know, we might we might have some collabs that we can do together, and really, and and you know, oh, I think so. Doing. I think so. We will definitely be talking about that. Thank you so much. Wow. With that, mm-hmm. I am exhausted from all of this. Phones not working, and the usual suspects doing what they do, probably. Um, right. So mm-hmm. I think I need some water. And to put my feet up, but I this has been a thoroughly invigorating conversation. The last third, as well as the, the two hours with uh, with Cola, and um, trying to think would be an appropriate music file to to close it out with. I don't think there will be one tonight. I think I will just put on a sound effect and say thank you for all of those who've listened live and those who've listened on the archives, and hope you'll join us tomorrow with Mr. J- Jackson Paul Hammeter will be coming to us again to talk with us about the issue of colorism, the mulatto question, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. This is Cree, signing out.